All right, hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is May 31st, 2023. Can you believe it? We are just days away, less than a week from the highest of all absolute high watch days. And brothers and sisters, we are in for a ride tonight. We are going to cover some fun things here tonight. But before I get into all of that, I want to, oh man, it's so excited. I was so excited today. <laughs> I got to stop myself from going a little bit too far off track. I was so excited. I was starting to feel a little bit of the heaviness again, knowing what's coming and having the understanding that we do. And and all of a sudden, I just, I was sitting in my garage, as you guys know I do, and, and I'm pondering these things and I'm thinking on the scriptures and I'm thinking of the times and the seasons, putting these things together and, and something our brother Yanni shared. And, I'm, and then all of a sudden, the scriptures just, I'm thinking on this scripture and it connects to this one. And then I'm pondering that one and connecting to that one and it connects to that one. I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> and then I went out, I did some things for the afternoon, came back late in the afternoon. And then I was pondering the other portion of the video. And as I was pondering and putting it together and listening and deciding where I was going to cut and where we would listen to it. And I would show these differences and show what it all equaled in the end. I got all fired up again. <laughs> and then I went in for dinner. So it's going to be fun tonight. There's like two main sections and, and another one in the middle that's kind of all part of the whole story. But it's all about this coming weekend and Sunday in particular. Again, depending where you are in the world, I the, the 4th of June to the 5th of June, maybe even late on the 3rd, you're going to see what I'm talking about. By the time we're done, you guys are going to be so excited. You're going to have trouble sleeping. <laughs> it's so awesome. All right. But before we get to all that, I, I need to give everybody a shout out for everybody that that has helped support on the on the big call out that we did to uh, help with the books and the Bibles and 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 the needs and stuff for everything going on in Uganda and a little bit here, but mainly over there. It was awesome. So we're, we appreciate your support so much. We appreciate your prayers. It, it, it's been awesome. Our brother in Uganda has printed over 620 of the Ministry Revealed books. They don't go, just so anybody that's new. These books, you see, they're being printed here in Uganda. We pay for it and we give them out to the people seeking the understanding of the scriptures to be able to prepare for what's to come and so it, it, we don't give them out or or steve and his team don't give them out of course unless people have bibles unless they're already understanding scripture seeking these things and then they're given these books the majority of the books have been going out to t uh, to pastors and other teachers and seniors within the churches and like i said depending on when we go if you know if there's a little bit more time or even if not it doesn't matter man these books are getting printed and the printer this printer shop, he's actually now traveling with Steve doing teachings from the book to help people prepare. It's awesome. And Steve is going out to, um, to a, 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 a little conference thing. They've called them out. 500 of them are coming out and they wanted the book. And that's why we needed the book. But he also needed to get more Bibles uh, purchased. He also needed to get more materials, transportation, everything else. And it looks like it's going really, really well. So you can always go to Ministry Revealed right here, ministryrevealed.com, the, the donate or mission page. We've got this right here. And your continued prayers, man, it is, look at this. It's off the hook. It's crazy. Everything that's happening. And this is just a portion of the things that Steve, our brother Steve and his team are doing there. It is awesome all right and let me show this as well as we get going so that i don't forget you'll see this right here this intro you can find this intro series as i normally show it on our youtube channel in the playlist and i'll show it to you in a moment but essentially what it is is what you're seeing here there's a 22 minute intro video that will introduce you to this 30 minute bible study this 30 minute bible study and this heavy two and a half hour understanding of how it was all missed. Then when you get past and you go through all this and you begin to understand this revelation that has been taking place here for about five and a half years, 
and you start to grasp, you start to see this understanding of what all of these differences were in the Gospels. And you understand that it's prophecy hidden within the Gospels, speaking to different groups and different portions of people in different times during the tribulation in a pre-mid-post. It is going to blow your mind. And when you do, then you could start going deeper and you can go further into these videos right here. This is a, a detailed video to the first 30 minute intro video about the uh, revelation of the Gospels. This is going to reveal the discourses. The first will be last. The last will be first. It's Luke, Mark, and then Matthew. This is pre, mid, post. There's a worker group from here helping this group. There's a worker group from here helping this group. And at the end of Matthew, there's a worker group going into the millennial reign. It's all revealed in the Gospels. It's going to blow your mind. This shows you just a glimpse to be able to see where pre, mid, and post are in, in the Gospels. You can see it in the triumphal entry, the transfiguration, and the, the Passover resurrection story of Christ. It is, and, and this is just one glimpse. We can do it and show it to you from the beginning of creation to the end of Revelation. It is pre, mid, and post. It's all true. You can understand the revelation laid out from, from Revelation chapter 6 till chapter 14, all laid out as never before seen once you understand this second intro video right here that the truth of the revelation is 14 years and the reason it was missed was because we never understood who mark and luke were truly speaking to we've always gone to the gospel of matthew and when you do that the entire church, the entire world, the, the house of Israel with the Gentiles grafted in have all missed that Mark and the differences in his gospel is the first seven years of seals. Matthew's is the seven years of trumpets. It's going to blow your mind. This here is the mystery of the seven churches revealed for the end of days. It, it's over the top when you understand these things. This is when you're prepared, when you've spent some time and you go deeper into it. You can go to our Ministry Revealed page and go to the book. It's available on free PDF in five different languages. You can read it in English from the website. You can listen to it from the website, or you can get the book on Amazon. It doesn't matter which way you want to do it. You will see these things, even the seven churches. We're going to briefly touch on it at one point just to make a point in the story of creation that will perfectly line up to the seven churches that's going to blow your mind you're going to see for yourself that there is a reason the chapters and the verses and so forth throughout scripture were 100 percent unequivocally separated being led by the holy ghost whether the people knew it or not just as the spirit led the writers of the scriptures so too did the Spirit lead those who went through it and divided it for us to be able to relate and to understand and follow? It's over the top. When you see it, it's, it, it's another one of those things that points to say, oh my goodness, this is awesome. It, it, every single one of these details proves every other part of the revelation that we have had here for the last five and a half years. And what we're going to be going into as we get going here is going to do it even more from something that our brother Yanni over in Greece found, you see, and I love it. I love it. I love it because what it shows is that those who spend the time to seek out the scriptures and the revelations revealed here and you begin to understand it and your questions get answered and you start digging in and you start seeking these things for yourself, guess what? You're going to start finding things on your own. And many, many people have done that and then shared it. And then I dig more and I put in more pieces to it and I share it with everybody when I find when somebody shares something that really just gets me going. And this is what Yanni has done. And you're going to see what I'm talking about when we get to it. It's so awesome. And that's just the first part of the video. Don't forget, we're talking about the season and time that we're in that we're just days away from. We're going to prove it scripturally, historically, apocrypha, sun, moon, and stars. The combination of calendars and what they did in, in, in 
the time of Christ, just before Christ, even into the time of Christ, and what came after, they all line up. It's crazy. It is so exciting, guys. As you know, I have never had a thus say it the Lord. I haven't had dreams and visions. It is the revelation of scripture that's been happening for five and a half years. And when you see this, you're going to be picking your jaw up off the floor. It's going to be that exciting. It's, oh man, God is good. All right. So because my computer is working like crazy, because I've got so many tabs open, you see, I, <laughs> they all go across like 60 some tabs and we're covering almost all, or we're covering just about every tab, guys. So hold on tight. So I'm going to close this one off now because that one gets working really hard. Oh, and I don't want this to start well, yet. Sure to do oh, you see what's happening? It's not saving it. It's resetting everything because I've got so many tabs open. Oh, that irks me. But I think I have an idea of where it is. So um, with that, as I said, you can go to the ministryrevealed.com website. You can go... You can go to it from right here. You're going to see me sharing something from the forum so you can see what Yanni had posted. You can send the support here. You know, if it is just a few more days, so be it, right? Then your money won't be useful to you anyways. We want to grow it, man. It is growing by thousands over there in Uganda. People are hungry to understand the scriptures and be prepared. This is the playlist. You can come to this playlist right here. And this playlist is essentially the same thing that we were talking about, you see, over from the website. You can see most of them are the same. There's a few others in here as well. But you can start with this one. When you begin to understand the Gospels, and you can start with this one right here. And this one will introduce these three. And then you can move forward into the others. It's awesome, guys. It's so, so exciting. If you're new to the channel, watch those videos first. It'll be worth every single moment of your time. So now as we get going and right before we get going, guys, please continue your prayers. We have a, a number of brothers and sisters just going through a lot of physical challenges and issues right now. Uh, I've mentioned our brother Todd in the past. Uh, he's going through treatment right now. So continued prayers for Todd. I know our brother. Um, uh, 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 um, oh, my goodness. Come on. He was in the live show with us. Um, why am I missing his name? Oh, come on. I think it's Richard. Yeah, sorry, brother. <laughs> I saw you in the live show and he's looking healthy. <clears throat> so we want to continue prayers there, but also our brother, Neil, our brother, Neil just had an issue, ended up going to the hospital and he had some fluids in his heart. So there was a, a scare going on there. Everybody in the forum was praying for our brother. And uh, I got a message today from our brother, Mark, uh, who's in talks with him every day. And the, the, it went well, and he's going to be going home on Friday. So continued prayers over them and over each other and over everybody that we continue to pray for. Man, it's trying times, it's testing times, and this is nothing. This is only the beginning, guys. So keep ready, keep praying, keep watching. Keep being strengthened, keep digging, because you're going to see everything that we've been sharing, everything we've been talking about. It's all true. It has always simply been a matter of when. And as I was talking with my wife today, we, we shared how Leviticus 19, right? We, we've now understood it. And I had never made the declaration till just these past few months that we had now understood Leviticus 19 completely. It is now understood. And for that to be understood, that means we are in the true 70th year of Israel. You see that? The true 70th year from the proper counting of when they came into the land, according to the Lord God. We know this is the end of the 70th. And in the Lord God's eyes, the Lord God's day is the Feast of Weeks. We've been saying this for the last while. It is whatever day is the true Feast of Weeks to the Lord God this year, vanish time. That is the time of the escape at the true Feast of Weeks. <clears throat> you could say it's like, quote unquote, God's birthday. Rings a bell, right? 
This is that video from that sister we've been talking about over the years that we've been sharing. Who was it? Um, oh, it's, man, what's with the names? It was on the tip of my tongue. Uh, Edwin. <clears throat> Edwin had shared her with us, I think, like four years ago. Something like four years ago. Excuse me. <coughs> Something like four years ago, Edwin had shared this video with us. And check this out. This video that she did was June 6th. 2012. Watch this. June 6, 2012 is the 16th of Sivan. Well, how about that, right? <clears throat> because aren't we looking for the 15th of Sivan now? This coming Sunday, the 15th of Sivan in 2023. And the 15th of Sivan is the seventh Sabbath and the Lord's birthday. And then what? On the morrow after begins the 50. Do you know what she said? in this dream vision that we've been sharing a number of time over the years. I think I've got the time of it. <clears throat> Listen to what she says. This is Hades the rapture, this is the rapture. Guys, Jesus is here, he's coming, we're gonna go. And uh, we stayed um, for just a few, I'm gonna tell you why. We're staying and we're rejoicing and we just saying, blessed be the name of the Lord and everyone was just happy and stuff. And um, I, we were celebrating because we were celebrating like it was God's birthday. And that's what I remember. See that? They were celebrating because it was God's birthday. See, this was back in 2012, guys. They were celebrating, <clears throat> she said, God's birthday. It doesn't really make sense to her. What do you mean, God's birthday? <clears throat> because Jesus was there. Listen to the rest of it. Birthdays, we were celebrating it. And um, towards the end of the dream, someone said, um, we went to Jesus in the middle of the street. And we asked them, um, when are we leaving? And he said, right after we finish celebrating God, my father, something like that. And See, and then they're rejoicing. So then her friend goes and talks to Jesus, who's in the street, and they're all rejoicing and celebrating. And he says to Jesus, when are we going? And Jesus says to him, after we finish celebrating my, my father's birthday. What? Pretty crazy, right? There's no such thing as the father who has no beginning and no end. Right? There, there, how does he have a birthday? He has a beginning, brothers and sisters. Not, and I, sorry, sorry. I don't mean he has a beginning, but the beginning of everything is his creation. It's his beginning. It's where it all started. Not where he started, but the very special day to him that it all began. What day is it that we know it all began in Genesis 1? In the beginning. God created. What does this mean? This means in Christ Jesus, God created. You see, it's the story where the Father gave everything to the Son and said, Go create. And it all started with in the beginning. What is this word beginning? You all know it. It's the Hebrew word 7225, which is first fruits, beginning first fruits. There is only one first fruits in all of human history. There is one first fruits. The other first fruits are the first fruits with leaven. Jesus is the only one who is the feast of first fruits. He is the first fruits. You see that? 7225. He is the first fruits without leaven. It was Jesus in the beginning. This is the beginning. This is what the Lord is excited about. And the beginning was what? In the beginning, it was the 16th day of Taurus. Right? That 15th, 16th day. That was in the beginning. This is what we're talking about. What does this start? This is the beginning of 50 days in 2023, the 16th of Sivan. This is the seventh Sabbath. What does it tell us in Leviticus about this time? Watch this. Right? Seventh Sabbath shall be complete even unto the morrow. After the seventh Sabbath shall ye number 50 days, and you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Who are they? These they, right? They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits. This is the Hebrew word 1061 unto the Lord. 
This is the first fruits of the old wheat as we've been sharing many times over the years. Right? Guys, <laughs> it's so exciting because we're here. We're here. This is the beginning. The 16th day is the beginning of the 50. You had the Lord was there with the Father, and then there's the beginning. This right here is the Father's quote unquote birthday. It's his beginning. There was great celebrations connected to the 15th of Savan. This is the seventh Sabbath. And I'm going to prove it to you tonight as we get further and further into it. Don't forget, what about the book of Jubilees, right? What about this from the book of Jubilees? We're gonna touch on this again tonight too, the well and these places that are connected to the well. It's gonna blow your mind. We did a video, right? You guys remember this? We did a video on the well not too long ago. I think it was like four months ago. Right here, the eye of the well. Remember the word well also means eye. It means ayin. What is ayin, right? Ayin is the other eye of Taurus that represents 70. When is 70 going to be completed? On the 15th day of Savan. So there was a party in the streets. Everybody was rejoicing, but they had to finish. They had to wait until his birthday was over. And then what? Bam. So it would be like this. Bam. They were gone. They were gone. It's early in the morning, very early in the morning on the 16th of Savan, Jerusalem time. For us on the West, uh, over here in, in North America, it's going to be sometime in the evening of the 15th of Savan. Now, could you say, oh, well, wait a second, what if, what if the moon is off by a little bit? Okay, well, then maybe it's going to be over here. You see what I'm saying? But you're going to see it's the 15th of Savan. This is the, the celebration with the Lord. This is the completion of 70 years, which means what? If this is the end to the Lord God, then this is the beginning. Well, how about that? Here she is with her video, and the date she puts it out was the 6th of June because of her rapture dream from that evening, from the 5th into 6th of June of 2012, which is what? the 15th into the 16th of Savan. Go figure. Pretty crazy, right? Lots of fun, lots of fun. And so when we come in here, like I said, we're going to talk about the well. Look what else happened. It was the seventh day of the third month. He remained seven more days. And then what? He celebrated the harvest festival of the first fruits with old grain. How many times have we shared on that? What is this harvest festival with the old grain? It's exactly what we know. The seven years of him working for Rachel, and then he gets Leah, and then he doesn't know it, right? And he gets kind of, he, he finds out when he wakes up the next morning, and he goes to his father-in-law, he says, what have you done? You know, you beguiled me. And what does he tell him? In Genesis uh, 29, verse 26, it says, and Laban said, it must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Brothers and sisters, you know this well, if you've been around for a while. The younger means the newer, and the firstborn means the older. That is the story of wheat. There is a spring wheat, and there is a winter wheat. The winter wheat is called old wheat. The spring wheat is called new wheat. The winter wheat is, planned, is planted late fall, and its harvest time begins at the Feast of Weeks. It can be used right away. It doesn't have to be held back. Spring wheat, on the other hand, spring wheat, is the one planted in the spring, but it's not ready until the time of Pentecost, 50 days after Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. But it doesn't mean they're harvested back to back. You see, these things play out over the years. This spring wheat is the stuff that's connected to the rapture at the time of Pentecost, at the end of the first six years of seals, 
and then it can't be used until Passover of the following year. That's why the rapture, as you guys know, the great multitude mid-trib rapture does not happen till about sometime around the middle of the seventh year of seals. This is the older that goes first, that has no hold back on it, that can be married and taken right away. That is what this story is. It is the story of spring wheat and winter wheat. The firstborn going first. And look what happens. Fulfill her week. Hello. The wedding week. Funny how that works, isn't it? Isn't that just blow your mind how that works? Watch this. Here it is this year. So here's the Lord God's. 70th complete. This is the year's end to the Father. And what happens? There's the beginning. The 16th day in Taurus. Because in the beginning of creation, it was all in Taurus. In the beginning was the 16th day of the first month. But the first month was Taurus. Now Sivan is Taurus. It's two months difference. So this is the Lord God's day. And then what? So you're going to see who else this is connected to. It's awesome. <laughs> and this is the beginning of the 50-day count. This is the beginning of 50 days. So what happens? The seven years, the 70 of the seven final years of the 70 come to an end in the Lord God's eyes. And then what does he say? The firstborn, the older first. What, listen to what he says. Again, we're going to touch on this a little bit later, but listen to, what he, listen to what the description is. First of all, we remember it's all by the well, by the well. He meets, her, meets Rachel by the well, by the well. And then what do we see about Leah? Leah is tender-eyed. Ayin! <laughs> Ayin! A fountain, a well. Ayin, so she is tender-eyed. Her she she's called the eye like seventy, like Ayin. And what is that? Do you know that it's the sixteenth letter of the Hebrew alphabet? Is Ayin? <laughs> when? Well, it means seventy. So when seventy is over, which is the fifteenth year, and the beginning of the wedding starts on the 16th of Sivan. It goes for what? Seven days to the eighth day. What did he just say? He said, fulfill her week. So here it was. 70 and that final seven of the 70 finished to the Lord God. When it's over, bang, then we go. There's the Gentile. Lay a wedding taking place in heaven for seven days. And after seven days on the eighth day, the Son of Man comes to begin his 40 days. Well, that's pretty crazy, right? Well, check this out. Do you know, see, the what? The 22nd to the 23rd. So this is the seventh day to the eighth day. Okay, so when seven's over to the eighth day. So the seventh to the eighth day. Do you guys remember this? <clears throat> about my video and I've, I've got a four the very first video i ever did was a video this is crazy is a video about the mark of the beast i had people like pastor sandy back then when he cited this was the first thing i ever shared with them uh, it was the first video i did in a study i spent a week studying it out and i put together this video and i did the video in two parts about the mark of the beast. I didn't know anything about, I didn't know I was receiving understanding yet. I didn't know the books were opening. I didn't realize that until September 8th, 2017. Well, check this out. The date of the first video was the 16th of June, 2017. There's June again. Wasn't hers June? Hers was June of 2012, and it was at the beginning. After the 70, at the beginning would be the equivalent. I do my video and it's on the 16th of June and the second half I put out on the 17th of June because of the, the program. I had a basic program at the time, so I, I can only do so long in videos and I put it in two parts, 16th and 17th of June. 
of 2017. Check this out. June 2017, the 16th and the 17th of June are the 22nd and 23rd of Savan. What's the 22nd and 23rd of Savan? When the Lord returns on the eighth day after the wedding. <laughs> I love it. Do you know why this is so exciting? You want to see why this is exciting? Because we know when the Lord's returning on the eighth day, but what's been happening in this ministry? A preparation, right? A preparation for the time to come. And a group that is going to prepare others for the rapture. This is the, the Smyrna, the 14ers, as the original 14ers, all the storyline that you guys know. This, this revelation of understanding through the Spirit working through me, just opening these scriptures for the last five and a half years. And the very first videos I do are 22nd to the 23rd of Sivan, which is the time when the Son of Man returns after the wedding. To that group that is to be girded about, right? Check this out. Who else are they? Well, we know they're the Luke 24. We've been teaching on it forever. This Luke 24 group is the group that Jesus comes to when he begins his 40 days, who will follow him for 40 days, and at the end of 40, three days later, will receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and they are the Smyrna workers that continue on through seals to prepare to bring in the great multitude rapture. You're going to see when we get into this, in this next part, you're going to see where this, this group that helps bring this people in. We've talked about it before. They are the John, the Baptist types, the, the Elijah types, the, the Moses types. They're all connected as types of these workers, and I'm going to bring more clarity to it. But who do we know they are? They're the disciples, Luke 24, Smyrna, Church of Smyrna, those who will what? Be willing to put their necks on the line, right? Romans 16, the Priscilla's, the Aquila's, who will put their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles. Because it's the Mark Gentile age, right? It's the time of light. The ones that Jesus came to save. He's coming for the lost sheep of the house of Israel and the Gentiles are grafted in. This is that group working. Well, check this out. What was my very first video? It was all about the Mark of the Beast. This Mark of the Beast video was my first video split into two parts on the 16th and 17th of June, which equaled, where are we? Which equaled the 22nd to the 23rd, which will be when the Son of Man returns on the eighth day after the Leia wedding, when he returns, and when he returns, what is he doing? He's meeting, as we've taught dozens of times, with this Luke 24 group. And what does he say to them in Luke, uh, in Luke 24, 44 and 45? And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. We've recently talked about this. This is mind-blowing that this has been happening here for the last five and a half years. Why? Because two things are happening here. There is a group being prepared as 14ers for this time to come. But they will then be the ones who are preparing the Mark group, the seals, the church world for the great multitude rapture. And listen, listen to this. This is what's been happening here in this ministry for five and a half years. Okay, we've talked about this recently. And when Jesus comes, what is Jesus gonna do? In verse 45, then it said, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So we know when the Son of Man comes for 40 days and it starts, <clears throat> which is that 22nd into the 23rd of Savan, of the third month, the Hebrew third month, when he comes on that eighth day, this is what he's going to do. He's going to complete the understanding, right? He's going to complete the understanding. And on the same day, my very first video, un un unknown, unaware to me, was all about the mark of the beast. And do you remember, guys, what this word for understanding means? Do you know that this word for understanding in every single gospel is only used one time? And it's used one time right here in Luke 24, verse 45. This word for understanding that is only spoken about by, for these disciples 
who are going to be given this understanding when the Lord comes for 40 days. And, and the ministry that started with the revelation of the mark of the beast, with an understanding of it, who then got the revelation of the Gospels, the Psalms, the Law of Moses, the Prophets, through understanding, not dreams and visions, not audibles, not, not any of those things, but through revelation of understanding. Check this out. The place it's used in Revelation 13, 1, the first time it's used, it's used twice, but the second one means mind which has wisdom. Look at Revelation 13, 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and six. The ministry that has been given the revelation of the is to come that started on the date equivalent to when the Son of Man comes to begin his 40 days, when he will open unto them all of these things that have been revealed here to prepare them, he's also going to give them the understanding of the beast. And the first video I did was the mark of the beast on the day when the Lord comes, he's going to open their understanding up. What? <laughs> I just caught this today. <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me? This freaked me out, man. <laughs> you add this to everything else? Oh my goodness. It's <laughs> it's over the top. It is over the top. I'm going to close some of these out. Like I said, just so many things open. Oh my goodness. Guys, we're just getting started. <laughs> this is so good. Well, now check this out. <clears throat> Here's our brother Yanni, our Greek brother. He had a, a real fun post, I think maybe two days ago now, <clears throat> in the forum. And in the post, he says, I was here first, right? Genesis 1 or Luke 1. And he's making the point of the, of the chicken or the egg. Well, of course, we know the, the chicken came before the egg. And that's what he's making a point of in relation to Luke 1. <clears throat> or we could say Luke in order. But specifically, we know starting in Luke 1 compared to Genesis 1. And what he goes on to say <clears throat> is that really what we know, you see, in the, in the last live show, this is why it's great to, to get going into this part here. Because in the last live show, we spoke briefly. Now, we've talked about it more in detail in the past. But Luke chapter 1, 2, 3, 4 is what we call Luke in order. You see? Luke knew all things, okay? He knew all things, and he had perfect understanding of them from the beginning in order. I mean, that's, that's probably the most bold thing to have heard in Scripture. Luke knows everything. <clears throat> he knew it all in order from the beginning. Well, what you find out is that in Luke 1, 2, 3, 4 is the mystery of the pre, the 40 days of the Son of Man, him coming after the sixth year of seals and his coming at the end of the sixth year of trumpets. When you go to chapter five, now when you read it, if you don't have the end time eyes, the understanding having been opened to you by studying those other things in those intro videos, you're not going to see it. You need to have the understanding open to know what these differences are in the gospels, to be able to understand that there is a 50 day period of time before the 14 years begin. That the story is John, John's resurrection story, Luke's resurrection story, Mark's resurrection story, Matthew's resurrection story. John's is the beginning of the 50 days and the first eight days. Then Jesus, the 40 days, is Luke's uh, uh, resurrection story. And then it's the seven years related or the Lord coming at the end of the first six years of seals. And Matthew's is his coming feet down at the end of the six years of trumpets. It's all there in Luke, Mark, uh, sorry, in John, Luke, Mark, and Matthew. And what you have here is the pre to the eighth day. So you've got the preacher that we call the escape hidden in Luke chapter one. You have in Luke chapter two, the 40 days of the son of man. Just like Luke, Luke uh, resurrection story or Luke's discourse. And then 
in chapter 3. You have, uh, um, you have the Lord coming at the end of the sixth seal is the typology in here for that seventh year. I'm, I'm going to show this all to you, but from a way you've never seen it before that Yanni is talking about. And what happens is when you get to chapter 5, you see the story about Jesus calling his disciples, calling the disciples and so forth. You have a bit of a different understanding, you see. I'm going to teach you to be fishers, right, of a great multitude. Why? Because Luke's group is going out. Those disciples are going to go out, and they're going to be the ones to help bring in the great multitude, which is the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. Well, look what happens when you go to Mark chapter 1. You have the, the beginning with the 40 days of the Son of Man. When the 40 days of the Son of Man are done, look what happens. Jesus calls his disciples. Yet in Mark's gospel, it's the beginning. It starts all in chapter 1. It's crazy. It's so awesome. It's so incredibly awesome. And that's the story of the pre-trib escape, the seven-day wedding to the eighth day in Luke 1, the Lord then coming in Luke 2, as his birth, as that typology, as him being born to start his 40 days of the Son of Man. Luke chapter 3 is him coming at the end of the sixth year of seals and him here for that seventh year of seals. And then chapter 4 is when he returns at the end, feet down on the Mount of Olives, at the end of the sixth year of trumpets. And he's here for that seventh year. He's tempted by the devil. You see, the devil says he has everything that was given unto him in a moment of time. Bow down to me and I'll give you all these things. And of course, Jesus has the victory and everybody's rejoicing. And the fame of Jesus goes round about and glorified all. It's awesome. It's so awesome to understand. Well, our dear brother Yanni, in this storyline here, noticed that there was a connection to Luke in order. So we've shown the Luke in order like Luke's discourse. Okay, so we've got Luke's disc, or sorry, we've shown Luke's discourse to the creation story. So we've shown how Luke's discourse, right, that beginning, that 40, 50 day start is the story of Genesis chapter one, verse one and two, that gap theory, the spirit portion. Then Jesus is made light. Okay? When Jesus is made light, that's like him coming. He's now here for the light group. He's going to share his light with the remnant workers from the Luke, and they're going to go spread the light during the time of seals. We, we've shared this before. This typology that the seven days equal the seven years of seals. That those seven days were to the Lord, that if we were there, they would have been like 7,000 years. And then in chapter 2, it goes to the 7,000 that were a part of that started from Matthew. And that's the flesh portion. And that flesh portion that started in with Adam is the Matthew portion. The 7,000 of years that were in, that to the Lord God would be like days. And what do they represent? They represent in the fractal of the smaller picture, they're representing the seven years of trumpets. So you've got Luke, the spirit group, Mark, the light group, and Matthew, the flesh group. Why does Matthew have the flesh group? <laughs> because we're living in their portion of time. Why do you think the Lord God chose Jews? He chose a flesh portion, right? There is a light group, right? The, the world, the Gentiles, the, grafted in with the house of Israel. That's the light group. That's the one Jesus came for the first time. And the spirit group are those that are spirit-filled in Christ. But we're all living right now in the flesh, which is why we're always to be praying and to uplifting and to be strengthening the Jews. They've been blinded. They've, been, they've, they've stumbled and fallen for us. The Lord did it for us because we are the three different groups living in their portion of time of the flesh. You see? It's so awesome. So what, what Yanni had noticed was just like Luke 1 was also to Genesis 1. Okay? Look what happens in Luke chapter 1. 
talking about perfect understanding. They have a they they have a child. They're old in age, right? They didn't think it was possible, but we know it happened through the Spirit. And what happened with John? John the Baptist, he was spirit filled from birth. He was knowingly spirit filled from birth. That's why he was so special. You see, <clears throat> listen to this. Luke chapter one, verse 35. And the angel said, and the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. Okay, that's going in with Mary. But we know the same thing that happened. You see, here it is right here. In Luke one, verse 41. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the situation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. You see, John had the Holy Ghost from conception. John, it's, it's all about being filled with the Holy Ghost. This is everybody that is the John type, the John the Baptist type. And you could say more specifically, the workers, that Luke 24 group, okay? Because what's going to happen at the beginning connected to John's birth, okay? At the moment of John's birth, here's the eighth day circumcision, okay? When she is her time to be delivered and she brings forth a son, this is the pre-trib escape. This is John chapter 20, Mary Magdalene. This is the pre-trib escape of the bride of Christ. What was John though? John was what? Spirit filled. Who is that spirit portion? In the creation in Genesis 1, it's in the beginning and it's verse 1 and 2, where the Spirit of God was over the waters. Who are the ones that have the Spirit of God? They're the Romans 8, right? Those who are, you might be living in the flesh, but you're not living by the flesh. You're living in the Spirit, right? You're in Christ, Spirit-filled. Those are the sons of God, the co-heirs with Christ. This is what's happening here. This is all that spirit-filled portion. And it goes what? Then you have the eighth day of his circumcision. Okay? You have the eighth day of his circumcision. Look at what he says. Okay, you have the creation of the spirit. And then you even have the conversation of light. And then you've got the flesh in verse 2. Uh, sorry, in chapter 2. Listen to what happens. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. This mystery that is called the gap theory, this mystery people think accounts for billions and billions of years. It doesn't. It's 7,000 years. But to the Lord God, it would have been like seven days. Okay? If we were there in the flesh and we saw all of that, it would have been like 7,000 years. But just like John, remember, or, or just like Jacob, what was it with Jacob? This is why it's so awesome. Listen to what it was with Jacob. In Genesis 29. Remember, where is he? At the well, at the well, at the, the, the stone was removed from the well, from the well, from the well. He sees Rachel there, but he ends up getting what? He ends up getting Leah. But before he gets Leah, what does he do? Seven years. Genesis 29, verse 20. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love that he had for her. Then he says, Give her to me, she's mine. And what happens? Laban makes a feast. You think maybe like the feast of weeks? Okay. Now, Jacob was expecting to get Rachel, but he got Leah. Because Leah was the first fruit, the firstborn, the, the winter wheat that had to go first. But what did he say? It was seven years, but it flew by because to him, it felt like, but a few days. It's the exact same story in this creation story. This 7,000 
is like a blimp. Like it just looks like it, it's a couple verses. It's very short because the love that the Lord had. You see? The love that the Lord had, the excitement in this creation, in this spirit portion that was created. Remember those who have the spirit of God. Who had the spirit of God from birth? John. <laughs> John had the spirit from birth. And we know from Romans 8, like I was sharing, that in Romans 8, it tells you right off it, right off the bat from verse 1. No condemnation to them which are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit we go down a little further we see in verse 14 for as many as are led by the spirit of god they are the sons of god okay by the spirit of adoption we cry abba father the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of god and if children then heirs of god and joint heirs with christ you see this is why people get confused. They all think Jesus is God the Father. He's not. Is Jesus God? Yes, he's the God of all creation. But he's not the Father. The Father gave it to him to create. This is the evidence. If you think you're a co-heir or a joint heir with Christ, who is God the Father, you're nuts. Okay? The Father gave it to him, and it's right here in this verse too. See that? But there's a group. From among this spirit-filled group like John, who are also what? Going to suffer with them so that they could be glorified together with them. This is the Luke 24 group. This is the Smyrna, the Priscilla and Aquila types. They're going to work seals, and they're going to be the ones resurrected, having put their neck on the line, having suffered with Christ. They're going to be the ones resurrected when he returns feet down to rule and reign with them during the millennial reign. This is that group of them that are being taken. So the majority, tens of millions are going, but a small group of several thousand, I believe 24,000 are gonna be chosen to remain and they're gonna be those right here. They are the Luke 24 group, but they are all a piece of those from the Genesis 1, verse one and two, Spirit of God, Spirit-filled, sons of God, co-heirs with Christ. You see? Where else do we see this? John chapter 1, right? In John chapter 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word. Well, who was the beginning? Christ. Okay? So in the beginning, the Spirit, the Word was the beginning. The same was in the beginning with God. You see? And then what does it say? John 1, chapter 4, listen to this. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And there was a man <coughs> just sent from God whose name was, hello, John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that's Jesus, that all men, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, okay? John was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Who are the ones that could bear witness of the light if we go back to Genesis 1? In Genesis 1, the only ones who could bear witness of the light are those who were the spirit-filled, spirit of God, sons of God, in this creation portion right here, who were created before the foundations of the earth. Only they could have what? Bore witness to Genesis chapter three, uh, sorry, to Genesis chapter one, verse three and four. This is where the son of God, this is where Jesus, who is the word, who was the spirit portion at the beginning, now is made light. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and he divided the light from the darkness. Exactly what we read in John chapter one. You have that first creation of the first two verses. And then what do you get? 
you have the light. When Jesus is then made light, and what does he do? It shines in the darkness, and the darkness never comprehended it. Who was a witness to that light? John was. Well, isn't it interesting? In Luke chapter 24, watch this. In Luke chapter 24, this is the only group when Jesus comes and completely fulfills this, opening their understanding of all of these things. What does he tell them? In verse 40, Luke 24, verse 37, he says, And that repentance and remission of sins uh, should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. They're the witnesses. You don't get this in Mark. You don't get this in Matthews. These guys are the witnesses just as John was the witness. John was a witness of the light. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing, yes, that the pre-trib goes at the beginning of 50. There's that lay a wedding, fulfill her wedding, fulfill her week. It goes from the 16th, from the beginning, at the end of the 70. That final seven is complete, that he worked for Jacob, uh, that Jacob worked expecting Rachel, but he got Leah. It had to be the firstborn, right? The firstborn, the first fruits. But there's a portion of them who remain, who are the John types, who remain, who have been prepared and will go out to prepare the way as John did. They're going to be what? They're going to be witnesses of the light. So what does that mean? It means they're also going to have the light. They're going to need to have the light. They're going to go to Christ the light when he comes for 40 days. They're going to be the ones, as we saw in Romans 8, willing to suffer. They're going to suffer as Christ did to be part of his glorification at the end. And what do we know happened to John? What happened to John as he prepared the way? Well, isn't that interesting? We're going to get to this in a moment. But we know that John what? Was sent to prison and beheaded. John was sent to prison and beheaded. What happens to the Smyrna group? Smyrna group tells you right here. This is the Luke 24. This is the Smyrna group. I know in verse 9, uh, da, 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 let's go to verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, that you shall have tribulation ten days, but be thou faithful unto death. Prison, death. So some of them to prison and some of them to death. But not all of them. Not all of them. Oh, you just wait till you see where this is going. It's going to continue to build and to lead and to reveal and bring greater understanding to everything we've already taught and learned. See, so what are you seeing here? You're seeing that John is the typology of the Smyrna group. Some will be put to prison. Some will be put to death. But not all of them. You see, they will, they're also the witnesses. As John was a witness, so will these guys be witnesses. So what else is John? Well, John has to have the light of Christ, right? They're going to be given the light to go out during the time of seals after the 40 days of the Son of Man. They're going to be the ones that go to Christ or will be brought to Christ, having been prepared, who will be the ones to spread the light during the time of seals who are witnesses, who will be willing to put their, go to prison and put their necks on the line. But remember this, not all of them <clears throat> are going to die. Not all of them are going to go to prison and put their necks on the line. So then what happens in John chapter 1? After the light, you go to verse 14. Funny enough, verse 14, right? That's like the, 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 the seventh year of seals, the end of the seventh year of seals. And it begins the seven years of trumpets, which in the big picture is the end of 14 years and the start of the next seven, right? So if, if the creation 
was really 7,000 or seven days to the Lord. The seven days were the seven days or 7,000 to us. And the 7,000 that were in a flesh from Adam is seven days to the Lord. The whole story is 21 years. And the end of the millennial reign, the new beginning of everything is the 22nd thousandth year in the beginning of eternity. It's also the story of the end of days as we've been teaching forever here in the ministry, which is the seven easy years, then the seven years of seals, then the seven years of trumpets. You see, there's that chapter 14 or verse 14 in the chapter 14 of John, the seventh year of seals. You're going to see this connection everywhere. So here we are, John 1, 14. See, then the word was made flesh. So you've got spirit, you've got light, and then you've got flesh. That entire story is the gap theory, verse 1 and 2, is the light portion. You saw where Jesus was made light, right? In verse 3. And then what? That was day 1. And then it goes 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then in chapter 2, after the seventh day of rest, then you've got what? The flesh. And Jesus is called the second or the last Adam. So when he comes, he was made flesh as Adam. And it's all right here in John 1. So how is it relating now to Luke chapter 1, 2, and 3? Watch this. We saw this connection now. So remember, at the beginning of John's birth is the time in this typology is, is the pre-trib escape, is the beginning of the 50 days, is the beginning of John the Apostles, John chapter 20, at the beginning of the 50, bang. That is the pre-trib escape. But there's a group remaining, right? Remember this, there's a group remaining. Like my first video to when he comes on the eighth day that these things will be opened unto him in their understanding. They're filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> well, get ready for this. Listen to what it says about John. There's the eighth day. What is that? After seven to the eighth day. So now you've got this group after seven to the eighth day. You've got this group that remains who are the types of Johns, okay? They're the type of John the Baptist. And we see here, listen to this, verse 67, John, uh, Luke 1, verse 67. And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost, and he prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. You see, they, the Lord has visited, and he has now redeemed his people. They're gone. Now you've got this group here, the Lord coming on the eighth day. Not yet, though. They, he's just about to come. And it says, he hath raised up an horn of salvation. So not the horn, a horn of salvation. This is John. For us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all them that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember the whole, his holy covenant, the oath which he swore unto our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies. Remember this. On the eighth day, a group being delivered out of the hand of their enemies. Man, this is going to be so connected today, it's going to freak you out. Remember this, that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. <laughs> it's so awesome. In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou child, he's talking about John, okay? John is a typology of a group of workers here who are going to be putting their, going to prison and putting their necks on the line. But are all the workers of Smyrna going to be having their necks put on the line, going to prison? No. No, you're going to want to remember that too. No, they're not all, but they're still John types. But which John type? You'll see. And what does it say? Thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. Remember what we're talking about? This is 
going on through this ministry is the preparation so that when the Lord comes at the 40 days, right, on the, after seven of that eighth day, there's going to be a group prepared, ready and waiting for him. They're going to already understand these revelations, but he is going to complete the story. He's going to open their understanding, including the mark of the beast. Fascinating. And when do we know, what do we know about this preparation? We know John, who's preparing the way, we know that, watch this, if we go to John chapter 14, remember, 21 chapters, like 21 years, like 21,000, in the end of days, look at this, chapter 14, after Jesus leaves from the 40, when he returns in the seventh year of seals, what does he say? He says, I go and prepare a place for you that when I go, I'll return, see? And if I go, verse 4, John 14, verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What is this place being prepared? It's paradise at the time of the rapture. It's paradise at the time of the rapture. If you remember, the only place you find this, if you go to Luke's Passover story, remember transfiguration, the Passover resurrection story, and the transfiguration are all typologies of Luke pre, Mark mid, Matthew post. You guys will remember this. In Luke chapter 14, verse 15, they were preparing for the Passover, right? And in verse 15, it says, and he will show thee a large upper room. Remember this upper room is only used two times. It's used once in Luke's story, once in Mark's story, but not in Matthew's. Why? Because there are only two places in the kingdom of God where this pre and mid are going. They're both going to the kingdom of God. They're both being taken up in a, like a rapture and a rapture. The first one is going to the third heaven. The second one is going to paradise, both are which are of the kingdom of God. That's why this large upper room is used twice, in, once in Luke, once in Mark. But the only one out of all of them that says furnished and prepared is Mark's. You see, because John and the John types will have prepared the way for his return at the end of the sixth year of seals. Some of them will have put their, gone to prison and put their necks on the line. Others will have made it through alive to that time of his remnant workers. That remnant group being prepared to go out and work during seals. This is that prepared. Now watch this. Let's keep going into the end of Luke. Remember this, delivered out of the hand of our enemies. Prophet Most High, before the face of the Lord, to prepare his way. See? For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord. The second half of verse 26 of Luke 1. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord. Remember, at the beginning of 40 days, the 40 days of the Son of Man is about to start. They're going to be before the face of the Lord. <clears throat> They're going to be preparing them during the time of seals because it's going to begin with what? Division. Right? Lord is coming to bring division. To have people make a decision. Listen to this. Verse, seven, uh, verse 77. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Isn't that fantastic? Isn't that exactly what he tells them in Luke 24? Do you know Luke 24 doesn't even talk about baptisms? I believe we should be baptized now. I believe being baptized is necessary. I believe it's part of the kingdom of God to go to the third heaven. I believe if you haven't, you should be baptized. You can send me an email from the website or better yet, go to the, under this video in the description box and you could email me there, theministryrevealed.com and I'll send you in for information. I believe it's the difference or one of the differences and I believe that it's important. But you see, because during seals, there's too much craziness going on. They will no longer have the chance to go to the third heaven anyways, okay? But there's gonna be a future baptism, which we know is for something else. This is the one in Christ, right? For in Christ to be spirit-filled. Well, isn't that funny? There's no conversation about receiving the Holy Ghost and the free gift of the Holy Ghost and the baptism and as acts, right? <clears throat> that group is gone. 
But listen to what it says. So this is the same wording that you get from Luke's resurrection story to that group that's going to go out, follow him for 40 days, and then go out during the time of seals. You go to Mark's, it's different. You go to Matthew's, it's different. Verse, Luke 1, verse 78. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on I had visited us. Listen to this, verse 79. Here it is. To give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. To guide our feet in the way of peace. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. You see, it's kind of like what we've been saying. We're, we're in the wilderness of the internet spread around the world. Most people don't want to hear what we say. We're not invited to churches or everywhere else except how it's exploding in Uganda because they're hungry. They want to be prepared and ready in the Lord. But you see, it's like being in the wilderness of, of the internet, the wilderness around the world. But what else? Look at this. To give light unto them that sit in darkness. So it's, it has this connection to John. You see, John, it said, wasn't that light. John wasn't that light. Jesus was the light. John was a witness of that light. But don't you think John needed to have the light of the Lord to be able to go out and do this? Don't you think it's connected that there's going to be those with the Lord for 40 days as the Luke group who are going to need the light of the Lord? to go and spread the light to the light group. You see this? That's why if you take it back to Genesis 1 from Luke 1, it's all about the spirit group and the spirit group who is John, who is the Luke portion. They're the spirit group who were witnesses to the light, connected all to the information and everything going on in Luke 1. The group that goes right at the beginning, spirit filled, the group that remains during the wedding when the Lord returns on the eighth day. They're going to be witnesses what? To the light. But when the Lord's done at the end of 40 days, does that mean the light of the world is gone? No. They're going to be the ones receiving light, just as we saw the type of John at the end of Luke 1. Let me prove it to you. In John chapter 8, check this out. What's John chapter 8? Right here, right near the beginning, see? John 21, 21 chapters, all in order. They all give typologies throughout his chapters to insight into the end of days. What do we see in John chapter 8? Early in the morning, the woman taken in adultery. That's like a Gentile woman is the typology. You see the stones throw. Nobody can throw the stone except him who has no sin. That'll be Jesus throwing the stone. Only him standing, only the woman and him standing together. You see, this is like that wedding taking place in heaven. And then what happens? He comes for his 40 days. He's coming after the wedding. And look at what it says in John 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, here it is, I am the light of the world. Hello. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. There it is. The exact same information. Now listen to this. He's the light of the world. Okay? Whoever follows him shall not walk in darkness. Listen to this. But shall have the light of light. Who's going to walk and follow Christ? Who's going to be the ones following him? Who will receive the light of life? The Johns that remain. The John, the, the, the John Luke 24 Smyrna types <laughs> willing to put their necks on the line, go to prison. They're the ones that receive the light. <laughs> you could say the Elijah types as well, right? The Elijah types are the other types of John. You see that? They are the other, sorry, give me one sec. They are the other Elijah types of John. We're going to go into that in a moment. So here it is right here, the light of life. And I should have paused there for that second. <laughs> I paused because there was a text. My wife is picking up my daughter. 
And she was asking my son, come on. All right. So John is that light. These guys are going to have that light. And when we go to Luke now, we just we just saw what? We saw that creation portion, them being light. We see Luke chapter 1, those that are spirit-filled going first, that connection to the beginning of light. Those who are with the Son of Man for 40 days, that follows what? Well, that follows the on the eighth day, right? Those who are now going to what? Follow the light, have that light in the darkness. Because when this begins, the escape has happened. They're going to be what? This group in the darkness, right? They're going to be the ones like the Johns now that have the light, preparing the way, having the understanding. Check this out. I was debating where I was going to put this. Watch this. In John, in uh, Genesis chapter 49. Something we've been talking about, right? Look at this. Genesis 49 verse 1, halfway through. That I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. It's awesome. And it's about the 12 tribes, right? In their description. Look at the one about Joseph. It says in verse 22, Joseph is a fruitful bow, even a fruitful bow by a, well, there it is again, right? A fruitful bow by a well. But we're going to skip that for now. Watch this. Whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow abode in strength. And the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. Listen to this. Whence, from whence is the shepherd the stone of Israel? So what do we see here? We see a well, but we'll get back to that later. And we see the branches run over a wall and their hands and arms are made strong in strength related to a bow. Do you guys remember this in Psalms 18? Remember, Psalms 18 is connected to the escape happening. And what does the Lord do? There's the seven-day wedding. During the seven-day wedding, there's going to be chaos. There's going to be chaos. Israel is going to be attacked in the north. Tens of millions of people will have vanished. But there's a group, that remnant Luke 24, Smyrna group, that, that Luke chapter 24, uh, uh, sorry, that Luke chapter 12, the Lord told them, hey, be girded about. Be strengthened and ready when your Lord returns from the wedding. Well, listen to what happens. See, and the earth shook and moved. The Lord was wroth, right? Bowed the heavens and came down, made darkness a secret place. We see at the brightness that was before him, hailstone, coals of fire. We see in Psalms 18, 15, the channels of water were seen um, and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke. O Lord, at the blast of, the, uh, of thy nostrils. You see, this is all stuff we've been teaching on this for at least four years. Psalms 18 is the, are the events that are going to take place during the wedding week. This is the stuff that's going to break out on the earth. Now listen to this. Verse 17. He delivered me. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered in me because he delighted in me. So there's a group that's going to be brought into a large place. Sounds like those when he returns from the wedding who he said he's going to have a banquet with, right? He's going to deliver them into a large place. But what happened to these people? Verse 17 said, he delivered me from my strong enemy and them that hated me. What did Luke 1 say? Luke chapter 1, what did it say about John when his father was speaking? Uh, the prophet of the highest. Where is it? Oh, in verse Luke 1 verse 74. 
that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. See, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies. This is exactly what we're reading. Every single part and piece of this is connected to the first seven to the eight days. Look at that. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from them that hated me. Sent me into in a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. And the Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He recompensed me. What is this reward? It's the, it's the Luke 14 banquet that he's going to have with them when he returns from the wedding. And it would appear he's going to what? Bring them into a large place. But what were we also reading? Why, why did I come to this <coughs> in relation to Joseph? Right? Joseph is the connection to Jesus right now through Ephraim. But we know through his adopted father, Joseph, that there's the lineage of David. And that will be the time that relates to the flesh. This is something I just discovered because it's been baffling me forever because we know Jesus is through the line of Joseph. He is through Ephraim. That's why he came to save the house of Israel, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And Judah, the house of Judah was blinded. He came to save who? The light group, the creation of days, the Mark group. That's who he came to save. His, his connection is Ephraim. That's why his name was, is Osi, Hosea the Deliverer. That's why in, in Hosea chapter 1, it says, The Lord said unto Osi, which means Deliverer, go get thy bride. Right? Go get thy bride of whoredom. Go get your Gentile bride. It's, and then we see in, in Numbers 13 that Hosea's name, right? Osi has his name changed to Yeshua. So from Deliverer Hosea, to Yeshua, Savior. But then how is he also from Judah and the line of David? How is that possible? Through his fleshly father, Joseph. His fleshly father, Joseph, is his adopted father, you could say, right? It was his father from birth, but it wasn't really his father. This is why you see that conversation in Luke 3. We'll get to it in a bit. In Luke 3, and it says, as it was supposed, right? The son of Joseph, the, the husband of Mary, as it was supposed. They believed it to be. But in relation to the flesh, when Judah portions come, then his connection is the flesh, his fatherly fleshly father joseph let's keep going remember what we were reading about joseph because through joseph it said that they they uh, uh let's go <laughs> i lost i lost the thinking on it let's go back to it real quick listen to this uh too far okay so run over a wall and the strength of, of a bow and the strength in their hands, okay? Watch this. Psalms 18. Not only have we just connected it to Luke 1, but we're connecting it to this group in Psalms 18, to Luke 1, to this group connected through Joseph, which relates to this, this worldly house of Israel portion first before Judah. Listen to what it says. Listen to this. In Psalms 18, let's see if we can go up further. No, let's go to Psalms, let's start in verse 27. Psalms 18, verse 27. For thou will save the afflicted people. For thou will save the afflicted people, but will bring down high looks. Verse 28. For thou, listen to this, will light my candle. Do you think this is possible? Do you think all this is made up? For thou, here is this group that we've been sharing. Is this connection? Here it is. And the Lord is coming, sets them in a, in a, in a place, 
from all the enemies, from the affliction they were suffering during those seven days. He takes them into a large place because he's going to have that banquet with them. And when he's there, he is the light to which they are the witnesses of all these things, just as John from Luke 1. And listen to what it says here. For thou will light my candle. The Lord, my God, will enlighten my darkness. Oh, but it gets better. Verse 29. For by thee have I run through a troop, and by thee have I leapt over a wall. <laughs> Let's keep going. Verse 33. He maketh my feet like hind's feet, and strengtheneth me upon my high place, and setteth me on upon high places. He teacheth my hands to war, so that a bow of steel is broken in my arms. He strengthens their arms with to be able to handle bows of steel. They leap over walls. He lights their candles to help save those that are afflicted. Go back to Genesis 29, 49. The Joseph group which is all connected to this lineage. And what does it start with? It starts with a well and branches run over a wall. A bow is their strength in their arms and their hands are made strong. He, he gives them the light to light their candle. Everything. It's all directly connected. This Luke one, all of this group is the representation of the Smyrna workers. They are the Johns who will put their necks on the line and go to prison. But guess what? Weren't we also told something about John being somebody else as well? Right? John is also, maybe I'll save that a little bit later. Oh, maybe I can jump to it now. Maybe I'll jump to it now because it's that portion. So let me show you something else. In this, we know that John the Baptist is also called Elijah. But John had no idea. When he was asked if he was Elijah, he had no idea. All right? He said, no, I'm the one calling out in the wilderness. But we know if you go to the transfiguration story in Mark, if you go to Luke, you see nothing about John. You see? But when you come to Mark, listen to what they say. In Mark 9, verse 11. And he asked him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elias or Elijah must come first? And he answered and told them, Elijah verily, verily cometh first and restores all things. You see, we know that John the Baptist had to come to restore all things. Did John the Baptist restore all things at the beginning of in, in the 50 days, right? From that eighth day through the 50 days? No, it wasn't until the end when the Lord came at the time of the baptism, right? In that what we know is that the end of the sixth year of seals and that seventh year of seals. That's when the restoration will have taken place. John will have already been killed by the end of the sixth seal. John will have put his neck on the line, will have been in prison, put his neck on the line, and all of the John types of those of them who go to prison and put their necks on the line. But what else do we read? It says, and how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be put at naught. But I say unto you that Elijah is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed as it is written of him. So what happens? And look at what you see next. The great multitude. <laughs> because what happens at the end of the six years of seals? In the seventh year of seals, it's time for the great multitude rapture. That's why you see this in Mark's. You see, because this is the typology in his transfiguration of him coming at, after the end of six years of seals to start the beginning of the seven years of trumpet, uh, uh, the, the seventh year of seals. And so what do you see? You see that John the Baptist was the Elijah type. However, John the Baptist was killed. <laughs> Don't you think John would have been like, yo, yo, what are you talking about? I'm like Elijah. Elijah 
didn't taste of death. He got to beautifully go up in a whirlwind with the chariot. And I'm like, Elijah, what are you talking about? You see, that'd be a hard pill to swallow, wouldn't it? But we know John was the Elijah type. If we go to 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1, we see it right here of when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven as a whirlwind, right? So we know that this happens. So, you know, when we've taught on this in the past, what do we know this means? Well, there in the past, the way I've talked on Elijah is that those who are the John types and put their necks on the line, they're the Smyrna, right? And that those who are going in the rapture of the great multitude. So, so the hundreds of millions that will go in the rapture of the great multitude that are still alive, I believe maybe, I don't know, a few hundred million might die who are Christians, but the majority, several hundred million out of, I believe, somewhere around 1.2, 1.3 billion are going to be saved part of the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. That great multitude, how many of them are going to die? I don't know, but I know the majority from scripture, the majority will make it through having survived. Okay. So what majority? I don't know. You know, six, seven, like seven, 800,000. I don't know, but the majority will have survived. It tells us. So what I would have thought in the past, and I think it still applies to this in part because what it says is that Elijah then goes up in a whirlwind. So we would know, people will say, see, that's the rapture. What they fail to understand is that's not the pre-trib rapture. Enoch, which we're going to talk about still, is the pre-trib rapture. The mid-trib rapture is connected to the Elijah type. But you see, Elijah, so you can see that's a typology. However, Elijah was a servant of the Lord as John was. Those going in the great multitude rapture are not his servants. So the more accurate story of who the Elijah John characters are, are the Luke 24, Smyrna, John, Elijah types. Because remember what it said in Revelation chapter 2 about the Smyrna group. This Smyrna group are the Luke 24 workers. They're the Priscilla's, the Aquilas. And what did it say? Some of you will be cast into prison and put in, put to death. So not all of the, the seals workers, that remnant worker bride, is going to be put into prison and killed. Some of them are still going to survive. So who are the ones who are going to be found alive? The, serva, the, the servant Smyrna's who didn't have to be put to death and didn't have to go to prison and be put to death. So what do you have? You have both Elijah and John. So Elijah was what? The was. John is the is. And the is to come are both of them. But they're not an individual. The Elijah and the Johns are the Smyrna, are the witnesses, are the ones that we see from Luke 24, to which they are two, which are Ephraim and the good side of Dan. They're the 12,000 and the 12,000, not one person and one person. This is why we get that from Ecclesiastes 1.9, right? When Ecclesiastes 1.9 says, the thing that was shall be, the thing that is shall be. So the, what was in the Old Testament will play out in the end of days. What was in the is that we're still in, will play out in the end of days. You have Elijah and the was, you have John and the is, and is in the is to come, you have Elijah's and John's. They're both the same type, but they represent different portions. They work together to restore all things, but some of them will what? You see what's happening here? It looks like what's happening is that the seals workers, now I'm not guaranteeing this, but it looks like the remnant seals workers are done at the end of seals. Because they are, Elijah was a servant of the Lord. John was a servant of the Lord. They're both Elijah, John, the Luke 24 Smyrna types. One who has put the, his neck on the line and went to prison, and one who was still alive and went up in a whirlwind. <coughs> they don't, 
it, it's more than just representing the Elijah as the great multitude. It's the time of the great multitude, but Elijah was the servant as John. So the greater detail is that Elijah is the servants who survived, never having tasted of death. You see that? This to me shows that this is the point when the Smyrna, Luke 24, Priscilla's and Aquila's 14ers being prepared, you see that? will have completed preparing the way. We'll have completed preparing the way. Now, doesn't it seem a lot like to make a lot of sense when we think back of that teacher of righteousness, that he prepares the way, and then when the Lord comes, he takes it and completes it? Wild stuff, man. Now you can see where it's connected to when the two witnesses come and him being here and those who were with him who had been prepared, who the Lord opened the rest of the revelation to, four seals to understand the mark of the beast. Man, is it ever making sense. It's craziness. That was just the connection to Luke 1, to them going to the end of seals. <clears throat> so what do we get in Luke 2? Well, in Luke chapter 2, right? Even like Yanni was saying, <clears throat> he's talking about these things. What do we know when we get to Luke chapter 2? Watch this. In Luke chapter 2, it's like the typology, right? The Christ is born, okay? Where is it? Swallowing clothing, okay? Jesus is born. The 40 days of the Lord begins. And listen to what it starts with. Okay, there are the shepherds abiding in the field. And listen to this. And in Luke uh, chapter 2, verse 9, um, uh, Lord, be so afraid. Da, 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 da. Yeah, okay. Starting in uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And there were in the, same, in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel of the Lord came unto them, saying, Fear not, remember? But don't be afraid, remember? That was, that was the Psalms 18 stuff as well. For behold, I bring good tidings of great joy, uh, which shall be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, our Savior and Christ Lord, uh, shall be a sign of swaddling clothing. Verse 13. And suddenly, listen to this, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and singing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, we, peace, uh, on earth peace and goodwill toward men. And it came to pass that the angels were gone from them into heaven and the shepherds said one to another, let us go into Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which, it, uh, uh, which the Lord hath made known unto us. Look at what they saw. They saw the cloud of witnesses, right? They saw a heavenly multitude of angels. Wasn't well, that fascinating? Because who were the ones that were witnesses? The ones that were the spirit portion in the angelic realm in heaven. The sons of God. The sons and daughters of God that were part of the spirit portion. You see, now here has come the light. Here has come the light. The light portion, which is Christ coming to spread the light. And guess what? We go to Luke chapter 2 and the light is born. And look at what it says. We keep going into the light. And watch this. In Luke chapter 2, verse 32, listen to what it says. Uh, watch this. Let's start in verse 31. Which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, <coughs> comma, and the glory of thy people Israel. You see that? A light to lighten 
the Gentiles. <clears throat> Who is this light to lighten the Gentiles? What is this portion of the Gentiles? Seals. It's Mark group. It's the house of Israel to which the Gentiles were grafted into. This is the light. This is Luke chapter 2, the Son of Man coming as light, the cloud of witnesses, the angels gone in that were in heaven. It is Genesis chapter 1, starting then at verse 3, the witnesses that saw him. Just as the John, but see, <clears throat> this cloud of witnesses that we're reading here in Luke chapter 2, this multitude are the ones already in heaven. This is the group that was taken. They're already in heaven. John is the one who's the witness. <clears throat> the John, the Smyrna, Luke 24 guys, they're the ones remaining who are the witnesses on the earth, who are going to receive that light, who are going to be saved from their enemies, be given the light in the darkness. And they're going to be responsible for going out and spreading that light. It's Luke chapter 2 connected to the Son of Man coming as light after the eight-day wedding. The bride is gone. That Gentile bride, Leah, is gone. The remnant of those with the Spirit of God who will put their necks on the line. Some as John, some as Elijah's. They're going to be witness to the light. <clears throat> They're going to be rescued on the eighth day and be given that light. And then what begins? Then the Son of Man is gone. And what do we see? The night, uh, it says, and halfway through Genesis 1, verse 5, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So what happens? It's so awesome. Check this out. This is going to blow some of your minds. Now you've got day one. The Son of Man is gone, and you've got day one. Day two, day three, day four, day four. Check this out. I want you to remember this. We're going to share this in the next part. See, God made the sun and the moon, right? He made the sun and the moon at this point. The sun, the moon, and the stars he made on the fourth day. As we get into this season and time that we're in right now, and I show these calendars and this connection that they all equal the same thing right now. You guys are going to freak out. As beautiful as this is to understand, there's even more excitement coming for right now. This is like more preparation, more, more remnant workers, John's, Luke 24, Elijah's, Smyrna's. <clears throat> this is what it is. So remember this. This is day four. You'll remember it later. So then you got day four, day five. And then it all ends on day six. So chapter one <clears throat> and Luke's portion, uh, uh, Mark's portion, six days, which represents what? Well, in the end of days, it represents the six years of seals. Six days as the six years. This is the light portion. This is the creation of the Lord when he came as light for the lost sheep of the house of Israel to lighten the way of the Gentiles that are grafted into the house of Israel. This is all about Mark. This is the seven years of seals now. And it starts off with him being light and representing the 40 days and then day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. Check this out. Here's an awesome, awesome side note. Don't you find it interesting that chapter one, this is what I was telling you guys earlier, that the chapters divisions and the verses divisions, they are absolutely 100%. They were spirit led, whether the people doing it knew it or not, just like the writers. We have proven it hundreds of times here in this ministry. And we've done it with chapters to years as well, as we've been talking about here with John, as we've been talking about with Psalms, as we've shared all of these things in the past before, okay? Well, I'm gonna show you another awesome one. It, it's, it's fantastic. 
Okay? Why on earth did the seven days not all get put into Genesis 1? Why on earth did Genesis 2 start with the seventh day being the day of rest? Why couldn't these three verses be put at the end of the sixth day? Why, why couldn't they be put at the end? Three more verses and make it uh, Genesis 1 going to verse 34. I don't, you would think, well, oh, it's just the way it was written. Nobody ever thinks about it, right? <laughs> Not when you've got the revelation of the open books. We know exactly why. <clears throat> Let me show you two examples as to why. Just like the six days as we've shared, as we've taught. In fact, we've got an incredible uh, chart that shows it. The creation, the gap theory, the seven days and the 7,000. It's it's phenomenal. All right. <clears throat> but watch this. Six days we know is the light portion that represents the mark portion, right? The Lord came to shine his light. Now, after the 40 days, it's the six years of seals to when the Lord returns. Right. So it represents the six days. Well, guess what? Do you know when you go to Revelation chapter six? What do you get? The six seals, which represent what? The six years of seals. Not that if anybody's new, it doesn't mean one seal per year. That's not how it works. But when the sixth seal ends, it'll end the first six years of tribulation, which are seals. And what happens at the end of the sixth year of seals? Hide us from, right? Rocks fall on us, right? Mountains, rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is coming who shall be able to stand end of six years of seals end of six days in chapter one when you go to chapter two of genesis it starts the seventh day of rest or it what what if we go to chapter seven of genesis and what does it start the seventh year of seals. Oh, but it gets better than this. This was just a simple one. Let me show you one that I've taught on a long time ago. See if you guys remember it. Remember I was telling you guys earlier in relation to the seven churches that the seven churches are revealed here. We've got videos on it. It's in the book as well. We have even greater detail than what's in the video and what's in the book. We can even add to it now more than we could when we wrote about it. But we've broken down the seven churches. If you'll remember, here's the end time seven churches. You have the Old Testament was and how it played out over thousands of years. You have the New Testament is and how it's played out over 2,000 years. And then you're going to have the is to come of the seven churches. And they're going to play out over 14 years. 50 days to be exact, 50 days and 14 years. <clears throat> you see, it's so incredible. And that's why what was, what is, both of them shall be. And that's why I've, I've discussed this many times, that what played out over thousands of years is going to be so intensely impacted or packed in to the end of days over the 50 and 14 years. What played out over thousands of years will play out over 14 years. Do you understand why now Mark's discourse and Matthew's discourse say it will be as in a time as it never was since the creation? It says that in Mark's and then in Matthew's it says, and after this time will never be this bad ever again in the history of the world. That's how frighteningly crazy the end of days are going to be. So for anybody that says, ah, we're in the midst of seals, we're waiting for the seventh seal, have no clue what they're talking about. They just, just stop listening. They don't know. Don't go get confused by listening to them. I promise you. That's why Mark's at the middish time of seals after World War III and the Antichrist comes, that's the time of Pergamum when it's going to begin the worst time that it ever was since creation. 
<laughs> yep. You see, we've revealed this. What do we know <clears throat> about the seven churches? Ephesus represents the apostolic age beginning, the greatest revival in human history, <clears throat> excuse me, in the midst of chaos. And then into the midst of World War III. It'll be the greatest time of revival in all of human history ever and ever will be. This is the beginning of the 50 days. Smyrna is the beginning of the 40 days when the Son of Man comes. So this relates to the apostles being anointed in the start of the 50 days when the bride is taken. They remain during seals, though. They may remain further, but for sure they remain during seals. Smyrna starts at the 40 days when the Lord returns from the wedding on the eighth day. After seven to the eighth day, right? That's the beginning of the 40 days, and Smyrna will remain for sure during seals. All right? I believe it's looking more and more like they're going to end at the end of seals, but it's the apostles that carry on through. All right? But both of these are only during the period of, of 50 days, but they continue on during seals. What does Pergamum represent? Pergamum represents when the Antichrist comes into power and gets his power to continue 42 months, which will be at about the time of about two and a half years into seals, when, uh, um, when he will get that power to continue 42 months. And it will go to the end, see, about two and a half years after World War III. So World War III starts, it'll last about two and a half years, and at that point, Antichrist, just as the time of Constantine, is going to get that power to continue for 42 months until the end of the first six years of seals. So he's going to last 42 months, about three and a half years, right? And <clears throat> look at what it is. It's the time of Antichrist. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's the time of Revelation 13. It's the time of the mark of the beast coming. What is it? It's Mark's discourse when it's time to flee into the wilderness. You see, prior to that, it's the time of the espousals. It's the time of wanderings for the workers when they're going to go out throughout the world, beginning from Jerusalem at the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and they're going to go out throughout the earth. <clears throat> and they're going to preach everywhere, right? Just like we saw John, and they're going to prepare the great multitude rapture coming in. And we got Pergamum, right? So this is when the Antichrist comes into power about mid seals. Thyatira is historically the Dark Ages. And look at this. It's still the wilderness period. So this is when Antichrist gets his power to continue 42 months and the fleeing takes place. This is the rest of those three and a half years, those 42 months. This will take you to the end of the six years of seals. What happens at the end of the six years of seals? The Son of Man shows up. It's the reformation in the typology. It's the restoration of the church. And look at this, the period of Israel's kings. The period of Israel's kings. Jesus has now returned. This is why at the end of the sixth seal, you see him coming and the time of his wrath is come and so forth. He is now coming to be the anointed king and high priest, Zerub uh, um, uh, um, Melchizedek. But did you see what happens? These four right here, these first four churches are from the beginning of the 50 days, the beginning of tribulation, till the end of the sixth year of seals. You want to know why that matters? Because then these three represent Sardis represents the seventh year of seals. <clears throat> the Lord comes at the end of the sixth, and at the start of the seventh year of seals, it's the Reformation. It's the restoration of the church. It's the sealing of the 144, the rapture of the great multitude, and the Lord is now going to be established as king, <clears throat> as high priest Melchizedek. We've taught on this. You see? And what happens after this one year representing Sardis? Then Philadelphia. 
Philadelphia is represented as the 144,000. They're going out during the first half of trumpets while the Lord is still king. But what happens at the end of about three and a half years of the first three and a half years of trumpets? At the end of it, Messiah is cut off. And look at what it says. The period of Israel's removal. Because Messiah is cut off at about mid-trumpets. <clears throat> you see that? So why am I saying this? What, what does this have to do at all with Luke in order and with Genesis having six days representing the six of seals? Remember, why doesn't why does Genesis 2 start with the seventh day of rest with three verses? Why didn't they just throw it at the end of chapter 1? Because the beginning is the end, and the end is the beginning. Do you remember that? Remember this one that we love now? This is from the Apocrypha, right? The Gospel of Thomas, verse 18. The disciples said to Jesus, tell us what our end, shall be, our end will be. Jesus answered, have you discovered then the beginning? that you look for the end for where the beginning is there will the end be blessed is he will who he who will take his place in the beginning he will know the end and will not experience death <clears throat> it's the same story we're saying guys and i'm going to bring more clarity to it to where we are now but what do you see with ephesus smyrna Pergamum, when Antichrist comes to power. Thyatira, while they're still in the wilderness, till what? Till the end of seals. When what? At the end of the sixth year of seals? Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath has come. Why? Because the Lord is coming at the end of the sixth year. <coughs> He's going to be here during that seventh year. And listen to what it says. Uh, da, 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 da. Where is it? Watch this. Uh, Revelation 2, verse 25. But that which you have heard, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Hello. When does Jesus come? with that rod of iron at the end of the sixth year of seals remember psalms 110 we know when the lord comes as melchizedek right you go to revelation 12 verse 5 <clears throat> it's when he's coming at the end of the sixth year of seals listen to what it says uh, uh verse 28 and i will give him the morning star who's the morning star Jesus is the morning star. When is he coming? At the end of the sixth year of seals. What does it represent? The end of the sixth day in creation. And look at where it ends. Why were four churches, why were the first four churches put in chapter two? Why wasn't it three and four in, the, in chapter three? Why was it four and then three? For the exact same reason Genesis had six and then the seventh year of rest was the beginning of chapter two. It's the same thing like Genesis, uh, uh, Revelation, six years of seals, the Lord is coming right at the end. And then you go to the next chapter for the seventh year of seals. You see, when you go to chapter three, <clears throat> look what Sardis says. Look at what it says about Sardis. Uh, verse, Revelation 3, verse 3. I'm just trying to think of the places I want to go to. Da, 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 da. Let's start in verse 3. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If, therefore, thou wilt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt, thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Remember, Mark's group didn't know what hour either. Thou hast few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their raiments. Listen to this. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. 
He that overcome the shame, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot his name out of the book of life. Who's going to walk in white raiment? Well, how about we go to Revelation chapter 7, which this time represents, which is like the seventh year of seals, you see? Which is like the seventh day of creation being in the next chapter. <clears throat> and what do we see at the great multitude rapture who the seals workers helped prepare to bring in? And listen to what it says in verse 9. Revelation 7 verse 9. After this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations, <coughs> excuse me, and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Clothed with white robes <coughs> and palms in their hands in the seventh year of seals, when the Lord now has defeated the enemy. Antichrist was thrown into the pit <clears throat> and the seventh year of seal starts and here he is those who are going to be going to the rapture and they're going to be clothed with white raiment names not blotted out it's the same story guys I taught on this a long time ago <clears throat> this difference this reasoning as to why these four are in chapter 2 and these three are in chapter 4. It's the beginning of the 50 to the end of the sixth year of seals. Sardis represents the beginning of the seventh year of seals. And then we go to Genesis and we see this same storyline play out. The six days end in Genesis 131 in chapter 1. And then for some strange reason, you have three verses to end the story of the seventh day. Which we have been teaching now for a year and a half, almost close to two years when it started. And now what do we see? We see the exact same storyline. The Lord, when he comes for the seventh year as the seventh day, is followed up in the following chapter. Pretty crazy, right? So after this seventh day of rest, then what happens? It's the flesh portion. It's Adam created in the flesh. Well, guess what? Let's go follow up into what Yanni was talking about with Luke in order. <laughs> it's so crazy. Okay, here's what we know. Look at this. Luke chapter 3, verse 4. And as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. <clears throat> so what's happened? This represents the seventh year of seals. The end of six, right? This is the seventh year of seals. At the very beginning, the end of the sixth, the start of the seventh. This is like the end of Revelation 6 to the start of Revelation 7. This is like the end of Thyatira and the start of, of Revelation chapter 4. This is like the genesis the end of the sixth day and the start of the seventh day in the next chapter <clears throat> and here we have the one who prepared the way verse luke chapter 3 verse 6 and all flesh shall see him all flesh because what's happening you're coming into the time of flesh when this seventh year of seals and then trumpets started uh, when trumpets will start it will begin the time of flesh so look what we see. This is when the Lord comes, right? We've talked about this. We mentioned it just recently. Here's Jesus. Jesus gets baptized, right? The heavens open. This is the typology of Jesus' baptism. He's here in that seventh year of seals. <clears throat> and what does it say in verse 23? Luke 3, 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. Right? That means he had just completed his 29th year, and it was somewhere a couple, few weeks, right? Maybe a couple months after he had completed 29, so he was in his 30th year. We did a great video explaining this, and it's all revealed in our Shemitah year chart, everything there in order. It's the same as, you know, you ever hear people saying, um, oh, it was in the, it was in the 16th century. 
Okay. Well, if I told you it was in 1650, you know, like say when um, when uh, uh, um, they changed to the Gregorian calendar, right? Somewhere around the 1600s. So if I said, for example, it was 1625 in the 1600s, and somebody told you a story about something that happened in the 16th century, do you think it would be around, you know, in the 1610s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, etc.? No. It would be in the 1500 and something. It would be 15, 10, 16, 20, 30, 40, 50, so forth. So when somebody says the 1600s, oh, that took place, or sorry, that took place in the 16th century, it actually means 1500 and something. It's the same story that confuses this with people all the time. They think it means Jesus turned his birthday 30 and then it was shortly after that. But in reality, that would mean he's completed his 30th year and he's now in his 31st. That's not what it's saying. He began to be 30, which means he had completed 29, as you guys know, and started his 30th year, which began on day one after he completed 30. So you would say he was 29 and a little bit at this point, because that little bit is when he began to be 30, not complete 30. You see, and this is what we mentioned here. Uh, began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph. You see, you remember in, in John, Jesus says, I have another flock that I must bring. You see, I have another flock that I must bring. Because Jesus is really through Joseph, the lineage of Joseph. He's not Joseph of this fleshly son of Joseph who was married to Mary. But when you go to Matthew chapter 1, and you get this lineage through Abraham and of Christ and so forth, do you know where this lineage ends? Listen to this, Matthew 1 verse 16. And Jacob beget Joseph the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. Did Jesus really come from this Joseph for which this lineage comes? No. Jesus was not born of Joseph, of the fleshly Joseph, husband of Mary. But through this lineage, through marriage and his fleshly father, when the time of the flesh portion begins, he's through the David line through Judah. I had never caught that before. It never dawned on me. You see, it's like through adoption, through the fleshly portion. But we understand from Luke chapter 3 that Jesus did not get his birth as it was supposed through Joseph. Only in the fleshly quote-unquote adoption as his father was he. <clears throat> but we know his father was father in heaven. And his official lineage was through Joseph of the 12 tribes. Okay? So again, what are we seeing here? We're seeing this connection to him coming at the end of the sixth seal. And this is a representation of the seventh year of seals. Okay? This is that representation of Genesis chapter 2, the first three verses of that seventh year. This is the representation, the typology of, Gen of Revelation chapter 7 going into the seventh seal <clears throat> right here when the Lord comes. You see, it has been prepared. John has now prepared the way. The, the, the Smyrna, Luke 24 group has prepared the way and the Lord has come. So what would we see then in this typology? Well, if we go to Luke chapter two, not sorry, Genesis chapter two, verse one through three, we have the story of the first seven days. So it's that seventh year of rest, right? That, that seventh year, he's defeated the armies of the Antichrist and the Antichrist and the Antichrist is killed. The others have their dominion taken away. The Lord is there on heavenly Mount Zion. The Zerubbabel is with them. The two witnesses, Christ and Zerubbabel, 
are there, the high priest and the branch. Okay, it's all being established. The 144,000 are being sealed. They're going to follow the high priest wherever he goes. The great multitude rapture comes in, right? Just like Sardis, the ones that will be survived and the clothed in white. So what then happens next after that seventh year as the seventh day of rest? Well, then you have the flesh portion and Adam to which Christ is the last or the second Adam. So what happens if we go to Luke in order and we've understood all this to be the seventh year prepared, right? The Lord came at the end of the sixth and all this is the typology. The multitude now coming to him, right? Jesus is here and it all represents the seventh year of seals. Well, when the seventh year of seals is over, then it should represent, there should be some insight into the flesh portion of Adam that comes at the end of this seventh year typology of the seventh day for 7,000 years. Okay, let's have a look. Remember Luke's, type, uh, uh, Luke's genealogy is completely different or very different from Matthew's? to which we just touched on one portion. We'll check this out. In the genealogy here of Luke, in Luke chapter 20, in Luke chapter three, verse 23, genealogy goes in reverse compared to Matthew's. It starts with Christ, right? But do you know where it ends? The other one started in Matthew. It starts with Abraham, which represents Judah in the flesh portion. And brings it all the way to Christ. But in Luke 3, verse 23, it starts with Christ. And the end of this chapter, which is like the end of the seventh year or seventh day, should end with what? The flesh, right? Should end with the insight to Adam. <laughs> Luke chapter 3, verse 38 which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. The chapter that represents the seventh year of seals, that represents the chapter two of Genesis, seventh day, which at the end of the seventh day of creation is the end of the seventh year of seals, it is then followed by the story of Adam, who is the creation and the beginning of the flesh, which is a type of Christ, a son of God, which starts what? The time of the garden, because paradise will have come down, because he came on heavenly Mount Zion. And what do we see in Luke in order? Chapter 3, the seventh year of seals, ends the seventh year with Adam as the son of God, to which Christ represents the last Adam. Guys, the entire story is proven out in Luke in order over and over and over again. It makes no difference to where we look at it. It's everywhere, just as Yanni has found as well. It's awesome. It, it's, it's over the top, like I said, just thinking of these things. Being able to ponder and to see these things is... <laughs> there, there's no word for it. Spirit-led revelation in the mysteries hidden from the beginning of creation. You see... Let me go to one famous one we've been talking about lately. It's exactly this right here in 1 Peter 1. You see, 1 Peter 1 verse 4, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. For who? For the workers. For the remnant Luke 24, Smyrna workers, Priscilla's, Aquila's types. 
This is them. They're going to have a place, an inheritance reserved for them. They're a group who have been kept, who have been prepared for this time. And when Christ comes for the 40 days, we'll complete the revelation to them, to which they will then go out and prepare as John's and Elijah's, those for the great multitude rapture. And within these mysteries are the things that the prophets have desired to look into from when they wrote the books themselves. They knew there was more that they did not yet understand. And this is those mysteries hidden from the foundation of the earth to prepare a group for the time of the end. First Peter 1 Peter 1.5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, ready to be revealed in the end of days, wherein ye rejoice greatly, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through many fold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love, in whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith. You see that? Why? Because they're going to be with him in his presence. He's going to take them and send, bring them into a large place, and he's going to have that banquet with them. They will receive the end of their faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. You see, they wrote the was of the future is and is to come. It happened in the is of their time and it will happen to a group in the is to come. Hello. Searching what or what matter of time. You see, when seeking the timing, the understanding of the timing to prepare, searching what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister these things. They did not know it. This is the prophetic is to come and you don't believe it. It says it right here who will be revealed in the end of days, in the last time. Awesome stuff, guys. You know, well, what about this? People say, well, what about Enoch? People say, but Enoch never tasted of death. Enoch and Elijah. You see, those are the two that they like to point to. <laughs> We've covered Elijah now. Yes, Elijah can be a type of those alive at the time of the great multitude rapture. But more specifically, as I said, Elijah was a servant as John was. The Elijah and the John are the is to come Smyrna workers of the Ephraim, good side of Dan, eagle overcomers. They are the ones that represent Ephraim, uh, uh, that represent John and the true Elijah. Okay? But what about Enoch? Some people will say, well, Enoch, he never tasted of death. But that's what we know about Enoch. Enoch, you can say Enoch has a dual thing like, um, like Elijah as well. In the fact that everybody ready, watching, loving the Lord, repentant, diligently seeking the Lord, believing that he's a rewarder of them, you can all say they're Enoch's. They're all the ones who will be accounted worthy to go pre-trib. All of them. But... From among them, we know there is a remnant group that will stay. Again, the Luke 24 Smyrna people, the, the, the Elijah's Johns. But are they also a type of Enoch? They are in the sense of what they're doing to be accounted worthy because nobody really knows, maybe some people do, but nobody really knows 
who everybody is that's going to stay, but you can guarantee there's going to be a chunk of them from this ministry because it's a group that had to be prepared in these things. You see, the historical 14thers were Smyrna. <clears throat> Craziness. Wait until you see how this all ties together with the season and time. Okay? So Enoch is clearly that pre-trib group. But Enoch never had a portion that stayed and everything else. They were all gone. <clears throat> so more specifically, it's all of those going pre-trib. Of which the Elijah Johns were a part of, but they were chosen to remain and to serve. Okay? What happened to Enoch? He was translated that he should not see death, right? And it says, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So one, you have to be pleasing to God. But in Hebrews eleven six, it says, but without faith. So you need to have faith first, right? Before you can please him. See, for without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is God. And that he is what? A rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You see, everybody diligently seeking, watching, praying, repentant. Those are the pre-trib Enoch's going. And of them, a portion is going to be chosen to be the Enoch remnant, which are the Johns and the Elijahs. And they're a group being prepared now. So that when it comes to start, they will be given the remainder by the Lord. They are the ones preparing the way. Do you get it? They're the ones preparing the way. They're the ones that when Christ comes in these 40 days, he's bringing division. So that people will have to make a choice to believe or to reject the Lord. And they will have the time of seals to do it if they can survive. So it's best they cry out right away, which is important because the revival is going to happen right away. So the, what are they going to do? The Johns, the Elijah types, they're going to renew and restore families. They're going to renew brother and father and mother and daughter and in-law and so forth. For which when the pre-trib starts, division is going to be rampant. And that is the Lord's doing because it's time to make a decision. It's over. You see? Then you've got the 40 days. You see, the Lord and the 40 days. Enoch came first. Then you've got the 40 days. <clears throat> and then what do you have? Then you have Abraham. Okay? What does Abraham represent? Abraham represents the end of seals to the start of trumpets, which we were looking and reading about in Luke chapter 3. But what more specifically? Well, look at this. Abraham, right? So Abraham was representative of that fleshly portion, right? Through Joseph, Mary's husband. And what is Abraham looking for? He's looking for the place which has the city, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. The foundations are being laid during seals. And Abraham and those who are coming in, right? The, the fleshly Judah portion, who's also coming in, at that time frame of that seven towards that end of the seventh year of seals, they're the fleshly portion, right? The foundation was laid during seals and they're looking for that place where the foundation was laid after the Lord has come and everybody's freaking out. Well, isn't that fitting that it's Adam, uh, uh, Abraham? Because when you go to Matthew chapter one, that's the exact story. It goes then from the genealogy of Abraham to Jesus from his quote unquote father through husband, uh, through wife Mary. This is now his representation of the fleshly portion, and the genealogy of Christ starts from Abraham and Hebrews 11, which is direct reflection to the end of seals when they're coming in, is Abraham. Hello. You see? But don't forget, we're still talking about Enoch, right? We're still talking about Enoch. You want to see something awesome about Enoch? This is something we've been sharing on for a while. It's going to be a longer video. I don't care. I hope you don't care. Watch it in parts and pieces if you need to. 
Remember this with Genesis? Man, we've been talking about this over the years like crazy. And in fact, there was even a year or two where we connected it to this time. But what happens is when you believe that was the year, then you no longer connect and you try to find another connection to where 365 would be. But this is the 365. And we're going to prove it here again. What happened with Enoch, right? Uh, Genesis 5, starting in verse 23. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. What's 365 years? Well, haven't we been talking this whole time of days as years? Years as days? Genesis days? End of days? Years? Hello? It's a typology. 365 years are a representation of 365 days. Well, guess what? Guess what? If we go to 2023, what is this? Quote, unquote, the father's birthday? Waiting for the father's birthday to end? What would this be? It would be the Feast of Weeks, <laughs> right? It would be the Feast of Weeks, which we can go either Leviticus like we did earlier, right? So we know it's the Feast of Weeks. Watch this. Feast of Weeks, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. And then from the morrow after, that's the, the, the escape, right? That time, the, then the 50 days, all that stuff begins. If we go to Deuteronomy 16, we don't get the 50 days after. See, you've got, you've got what? Passover of Abib. You've got the bread of affliction, seven days of seven years of seals. Then you've got the Feast of Weeks. See, a tribute of a free will offering of thy hand. And then you've got booths, which is what? Seven days as seven years. This is the seven years as days for trumpets. These are the seven days as years for seals. And this is the pre-trib group at what? At the celebration of the father's quote unquote birthday. What is it? It's the 15th day of Savan. And when this date is over, then we go. Remember, just like her dream vision that she had? Jesus' birthday? Well, guess what? That would mean this is the end of 70, right? Remember that from Daniel chapter 9? 70 weeks are determined. And it goes on both ways, right? We showed it from both angles. Whether it's the 70 years from Jerusalem, or whether all the other parts, parts that we've shared on, we know it's the 70 of Israel comes to an end. To the Lord God, the 70 will end and the 14 years will begin. And at the end of the 14 years, it ends the 70 for Jerusalem. So you've got 70 of Israel coming into the land, 14 years, and then it'll be the end of 70 for Jerusalem. And what does 70 weeks that are determined upon them mean? We've shared on it a number of times recently, right? It could also mean not only days of weeks, which will give you the weeks count of the seven Sabbaths, but it also represents the feast of weeks. It is 70 feasts of weeks determined. 70 years of Israel of the Leviticus 19 count revealed and understood to the Lord God's date is the 15th day of Sivan. Is the 15th day of Sivan. Well, Enoch was 365 years as days. So where do you think that would be? At the Lord God's birthday, at the, at the true feast of weeks time? You see, you can go study everywhere about Enoch and when Enoch was born and when he was taken. And they will all tell you Shavuot or the feast of weeks. Don't let them confuse you with Pentecost. Don't let them confuse you with counting 50 days. We know it's properly counted the 8th, 15th, 22nd, 29th of every month, right? The dark moon is 
is a celebration, right? Is is a is another day out of the uh, 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 what do they call it? It's New Moon Day. Enoch was taken. Enoch was born and was taken at Shavuot at the Feast of Weeks, and it was not the sixth day of Sivan. You remember, we can prove this. We can prove this. I, it always baffles me. You see, if you go to Exodus chapter 12, <clears throat> okay, it's the Passover. The Lord told Moses about it, right? They had the Passover. They slaughtered the lamb. They, they put it on the, on the posts, okay? And then what happens? Okay, it was the 14th day. They had their unleavened bread. They killed the Passover lamb. And then look what happens. Everything starts, right? And Pharaoh, it says in verse 30, and Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house, uh, sorry, for there was not a house uh, where there was not one dead. And he called Moses and Aaron by night and said, rise up and get ye forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go and serve the Lord as ye have said. They went out, they took their flocks, everything else. When did they do this? Well, hello, it was Passover, right? It was Passover and it was evening. So when in the evening did they get up and leave? It was the 15th, right? The evening of the 14th to the evening of the 15th. They left on the 15th day of the first month. I don't understand why this is so hard for people to grasp. If they left on the 15th day of the first month, and it's right there in Exodus chapter 12, when you get to Exodus chapter 19, why is verse 1 so hard to understand? It says, in the third month, listen to this, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt. When did the children of Israel go forth out of the land of Egypt? The 15th day of the first month. So if it's now the third month from the day they left the land of Egypt, and it's the same day, but in the third month, how on earth could anybody possibly think that it's the sixth of Sivan? How on earth can it be the sixth of Sivan when they didn't leave until the 15th day of the first month? You're going to try and tell me the same day they left on the sixth of Sivan. So they arrived on the sixth of Sivan, which means they left on the sixth of Nisan. What, they left before Passover? Not according to Exodus 12. Everybody knows it was, it was the, 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 the sacrifice of the lambs, putting the blood on, then the angel of death, and went and killed all the firstborn. You see? And they fled on the 15th day of the first month. So if that's when they fled, and it says then they arrived in the third month, which is Savan, on the selfsame day, on the same day. It's clearly when they got there, the 15th day of the third month. And then we get the story of counting 50 days, right? Three days, then seven, and then the 40 days and 40 nights. So we have it in scripture that it's the 15th day of the third month. And then you've got a 30 day, a 50 day count. Well, let's check that out. Let's see if indeed from the 15th day of the third month is where it is. Well, right off the bat, we know that Enoch, and it doesn't matter who you study or where you read, Enoch was taken by God at the Feast of Weeks. See, the question for everybody is, what's really the Feast of Weeks? Well, it's absolutely not the sixth day of Sivan. 
the possibility was that it was the eighth, right? But we're going to see everything tells us it's the 15th day of Savan. Do you remember this even with the Lord's pendant? That was part of our revelation of Taurus, that on this pendant, they found the inscription that Jesus had on that pendant was this right here. It was three Hebrew letters and the Jews go from right to left. It was Ayin, Aleph, Nun. This is the representation of the head of Taurus. Ayin is the right eye of Taurus and Ayin is the 16th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph represents one, which represents beginning, which represents Taurus. Well, Savan is Taurus. And if Christ is the beginning, right? When was Christ born? Christ was born on the 15th of Savan. So you could even look at the beginning who is Christ, Aleph, right? The beginning and the end, Aleph, it's what? 16, this could be one, or it could also represent 15 at his birth in the beginning, right? As his birth when he when in Luke chapter two, he was born, we know he was born on the 15th day of Savan, which is the same time that Enoch was taken, which is what? The end of the 70 of the Feast of Weeks. And what's, what was noon? Noon is the eye called the bullseye of Taurus, which was the revelation that led us to this. And it represents noon, which is the 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it represents 50. So you have 14, you have 16, and you have one, but it represents Jesus, and he was born on the 15th day of the third month. So what do you have? You have the 14th, 15th, 16th. But if we go from right to left like the Jews do, right? You got the 16, right? One representing Jesus, his birth, and 14. Well, what else did the picture represent? Ayin also means 70. It's the 70th letter. Aleph represents one, and Nun represents 50. So you have 70, right? So 70 years comes to an end, and it begins. Aleph representing one, meaning beginning, represents 50. So 70 begins 50. And what do we have? The end of 70 and the beginning of 50. Is the 14, 15, 16 potentially a representation of the Lord coming sometime late on the 14th day to tell the 14ers? who represent noon, which is the 14th brightest star in the sky, the bullseye right on target? Do you think maybe this is when he tells them? You see, do you think it's representative of Luke chapter 12, where it appears in the wording that Jesus is going to tell them even before the pre-trib escape, right before it? He says in verse in Luke 12, 35, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. And then what is he going to do? He's going to come serve them, sit down and eat with them and serve them. Exactly what we were talking about. Exactly Psalms 18. Exactly the Luke 24. Exactly this group that is going to be Luke 14, the banquet, said in a large place, he's telling them what? Even before he's gone to the wedding. Is it possible 14ers are going to be informed sometime connected to the 14th of Savan? And then on the 15th of Savan, the escape happens, and at the time of the 16th, the 50 days begin? Is this the actual 15th of Savan? Is, is the Hebrew calendar even right? Is there anything else we can go on besides the Hebrew calendar that we know is connected to the sun, moon, and stars, by the way? 
We've gone in and we've shown that Savan is Taurus. When the sun is in Taurus and the moon, the dark moon starts in Taurus. So we know that the Hebrew calendar is, is on track here. But do we maybe have more insight that we can go to? Is there something more that we can look at? Well, let's have a look. You remember this? A lot of people like talking about this, right? John chapter 4. John chapter 4, it's all about Samaria, the Samaritan woman, Samaria, Samaria, Samaritan woman, right? And look at this. In Luke chapter 4, verse, uh, sorry, in John chapter 4, verse 6. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria. It's all about this Samaritan woman, Samaria, Samaritan woman, all, all of it, right? And what's there? Jacob's well. Do you think there's a possibility that it's connected to the, the Son of Man coming? Look at the number. The Greek number for the word well is 4077. Like 40 days and then seven and seven years to go. Crazy, right? Look, it means fountain. It means well. And he's here with what? It's the story of the Samaritan woman, right? And here he is, the Samaritans, the Samaritan woman. We read all this story. Well, do you remember when you go back into Luke chapter 17? This is the one only found in Luke 17, by the way. And what do you have? The story of the 10 lepers. Where was it? In Luke, uh, Luke 17, verse 11, that he passed through the midst of Samaria. So he's again in Samaria, like the Samaritan woman. And what happens? 10 men were there, right? Lepers were there. And in verse 13, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Okay, what is Samaria? Samaria and the Samaritans, Jesus wasn't supposed to communicate with them, right? Who are you? You're not supposed to talk to us like the Samaritan woman said, right? It's, it was the house of Israel. The Gentiles were grafted in with them. And look what happens. It says in 10 of them were cleansed, right? And in verse 15, it says, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. Listen to this. And he was a Samaritan. One out of 10. In verse 17 says, And Jesus answering said, Were there not 10 cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that returned to give glory to God, save this stranger. Save this stranger. Do you remember who else is called a Gentile bride stranger? Ruth. Ruth. Do you remember in John chapter 8? Do you remember in John chapter 8, this woman taken in adultery, right? It means adultery. And when you go to the story of Ruth, I believe it's chapter 2, Ruth calls herself a stranger in Ruth chapter 2, verse 10, right? Why hast thou taken knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? It's a typology, non-relative. It means a stranger, right? Like Gentiles, adulteress. Was she an adulteress? No, of course not. It's the typology of a Gentile. There she is. And it's right there in the Samaritan woman or the Samaritan leopard who was the one of the 10. Why do you think it was one of 10? We've taught on it many times. Because it's only 10% of those who claim in Christ, of those who called out to Christ, like the 10 lepers, only 10% are going. Only 10% are like Enoch, diligently seeking. Have faith, love him, diligently seek him, and believe that he's a rewarder. That's the 10%. And look at the story that follows next. It's the literal story of the end of days. <clears throat> it's the literal story that we've taught on so many times. 
what happens when you go to the stranger in John chapter 8? It's the literal story we've been talking about, the Gentile bride and then the Son of Man coming as light in the start of 40 days. We've directly connected that to Ruth many times over the years. And here we are in John chapter 4. And it's all about the Samaritan woman. And the Samaritan woman is at the well when Jesus is at the well. Isn't that fascinating? That when we go back into Genesis chapter 49, look at what we see. Remember, this is about the last days, he even says. And when we went down to Joseph, it started with what? In verse 22, Genesis 49, verse 22, Joseph is a fruitful bow, even in a fruitful bow by a well, whose branches run over. See, so it, you have what? You have the story of a well, and then you've got the time of the beginning of the end of days. You see, you've got the Samaritan woman at a well, and then you're going to see the start of the end of days. You've got the, the stranger and the leopard. And then you've got the story of the end of days. Leper, not leopard. <laughs> Look at the word for well. An eye. It's a fountain, a well, just like the Greek one was. Just like the Greek one. But in the Hebrew, look what more it tells you. It means I. It means I in. What is I in? The 16th letter of the Hebrew alphabet that represents 70, which is the other I of Taurus. And Taurus, the 16th day of Savan is the beginning of the 50 days. <laughs> I don't know what more I could say. <coughs> I don't know what more I could say. My throat is ripped, but I ain't done yet. Oh, we still have more to go, so hold on tight. This, I pray, is the last video. It will carry everybody through. Watch it in part. Watch it in pieces right to the time of the escape. Brothers and sisters, this is awesome. Let's go back to John chapter 4. We still have to break down the video of the days, right? Man, it's so exciting. Okay, Samaria, Samaritan, Samaria. Look at this. He's by Jacob's well. Well, isn't that fascinating? Because there's another well, which is Jacob's well. <laughs> when Jacob comes to the well and the stone is removed, and what's the story of him meeting Rachel and the story of the well and being with the daughter and all that stuff, right? So awesome. Let's go back to John 4. <clears throat> Look at this for timing. Okay, all about the Samaritan woman, right? All the story, we've all read about this. The, the pot, the water, and then listen to this. Adds a little bit more seasoning to it all in the timing, right? Starting in John 4, verse 34, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months and then comes harvest. Do you know why he's saying this? Because the actual final harvest season of the year, okay, this is Sukkot, Tabernacles. So Tishri, one, uh, Tishri 15, the seventh month, 15th day, is the beginning of the final harvest and the celebration, and it's the final harvest of the year. That's what it is. So what do you think four months early is? Third month, 15th day? Darn right it is. Say ye not there are yet four months, then comes the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes. Remember Luke 21? Then lift up your eyes, right? For your redemption draweth nigh. I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages. And he that gathereth fruit unto eternal life, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth shall rejoice together. You see, all about the time, the Samaritan, and then them going out. Guys, I'm telling you, it's the 15th of Savan. The question is, some people will say, ah, oh, we're still one month off. <clears throat> ah, it's not, it's not uh, a dark moon that that is new moon it's it's full moon that's new moon 
No, it isn't. All we got to do for that is go to the Feast of Trumpets. Look at this, Leviticus 23. And how do we know it's not one month off? Well, I'm going to show you both reasons why, and in fact, nail it down with the third, proving them all lined up together. And why? Because we're in Taurus. Taurus is the beginning. You can't be a month off if Taurus is the beginning. Listen to what it says about the Feast of Trumpets. This is all you get for the Feast of Trumpets. Feast of Trumpets is a holy convocation and a blowing of trumpets. When? In the seventh month, on the first day of the month. New moon. And people say, oh, that could be full moon. No, it can't be. Because the definition is right here in the Hebrew word 2313, uh, 2318, and it means what? To rebuild. To rebuild. If the moon is full, and it's the beginning of the month as the full moon, and you start to take away from the moon, right? You've got a circle here, a completed circle, and as each day passes, you take a little bit more of it away. Is that rebuilding? No. If it's dark moon and you can't see it, and then all of a sudden you're seeing a little crescent, and then you're seeing a little bit more, and you're seeing a little bit more, and you're seeing a little bit more. Is that rebuilding? Absolutely. That's the simplest picture you can give of the beginning of the month is the rebuilding, is the building, rebuilding of the moon, crescent by crescent by crescent, building and building and building till it comes full. Hello. This is the first day of the month at the rebuilding of the moon from the dark moon. All right. So it is not full moon. Don't allow people to confuse you with that. And it doesn't mean just because somebody teaches that, that everything else is just completely out of whack. But that part is clearly wrong. All right. Now, let me prove to you. Is this June 4th actually? We know, we, we've got it. Leviticus has shown to us that this is the 70th year. <clears throat> we know that 70 ends at the Feast of Weeks. That is why it's so fitting that Enoch 365 ends at the 70th at the Feast of Weeks, you see? Because the Feast of Weeks to the Lord God, 70 are determined. And when those 70 are done, when? At the Feast of Weeks, that means to the Lord God, that's his year's end. Which means Enoch turning three or being 365 would be what? At the year's end. And he vanished 365. <clears throat> Let's see what we can do now to prove this out with the two main calendars that will break it all down for Check this out. This is awesome. So this is a, a video. I've shared this guy before, James Tabor. Um, he's, he does a lot of study. His focus studies <clears throat> is from second temple period time. He's a scholar. All right. And this is all about the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Essene calendar. But he also talks about the Hebrew one. And you're going to see these snippets and these clips that he's talking about. And what you have to remember is he's talking from 2009 and he doesn't know, obviously, what is taking place in 2023 that does not happen. I have gone back to 2015 and I've gone all the way to 2037. And in 2015 and in 2020 and in 2034, I went, I went all the way to 37, 2037. So from only in 2015 and only in 2034, it comes close, but it's on the wrong side. Only in 2023 will you see this. So you remember how excited we are that this is now understood? We have got this down pat that this is the end of 70 for Israel from Leviticus. This is the end of 70 from when they got Jerusalem and it's 14 years in between. It's absolutely perfect. And so is the entire count that got us there. Well, you're about to see that only 2023 does this happen where the Hebrew calendar 
and the Essenes, which they call through Jubilees, but it's more clear in the Essenes calendar, are actually in line. And it's even more than that. It's even more than that because it's also in line with the 14ers who through Polycarp learned from John the Apostle on understanding that it's at Abib. Do you know that this year in 2023, all of them fall in agreement? Ah! It's awesome. Listen to this. Chronology and the calendar. Um, the calendar, I was saying jokingly to somebody just a minute ago, it's the most important thing to uh, a biblically based religion in a certain way. It's the most important functional thing. There can be beliefs. People can sit and hold certain ideas in their head and in their heart and say, this I believe, right? Confess the creeds. But what if they want to show up at the right time for a gathering? And uh, obviously, if there were no days of the week, we'd be in complete chaos. So we have a seven. There, you see that? <coughs> so he's saying, what is the importance? Why, why keep a calendar? What's the, what's the need or the importance for a calendar? That's essentially what he's saying. Well, it's to keep appointments. Right? It's to keep appointments, to know that you're observing things biblically, to observe and to understand and to be watching and seeking and, and knowing these things and observing the Lord's fast and feasts and everything at the right times. You see? <clears throat> if you don't know, then you're always going to be wrong. You see, at least biblically, there's protection, right? Is it Colossians chapter 2, verse 16? Where it says right here, right? So let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. OK, so don't let anybody beguile you of your reward in your voluntary humility, meaning you can be observing right now the Passover's on the wrong day. Right. The holidays on the wrong day, the new moons on the wrong day, like some people want to do it on the full moon, whatever. Right. People are observing Sabbaths on on this day or that day. The Lord said it's OK. Why? Because it'll be corrected when I come. Don't worry. OK, that's what's going on. So we don't have to worry about it. But if we want to understand. Seasons and times. It would be good to understand and have a grasp of the calendar. The problem is. <laughs> Which one? Well, you're going to witness that this year, it ain't going to matter. Listen to this. Also, in the time of the Second Temple, we're kind of focusing on Second Temple Judaism. That's my field. That's what I mainly talk about. And what we began to pick up is the, well, let me start like this. The standard Jewish calendar today, look, it says Jewish calendar. There you go. Uh, the way to know the Jewish calendar today, unless you want to do a lot of math, which is possible to do. And you can go to the Jewish Encyclopedia, it's online, print out the article on Jewish calendar, and you could actually do the math with a calculator. You wouldn't have to use this. But it would really be a waste of time because it's all done for you. There are all kinds of um, extra days and intercalations and whether there's a 13th month or 12 months, just buy the calendar, please. It's easier. So you can open up and you can say, That's okay. That's the Hebrew calendar if we I have. Go to, um, this is a pretty nice calendar here. I'm going to go to this month, July 209, it says Tammuz, and today is the 17th, or 16th actually on this. No, it isn't, I'm sorry. 17th of Tammuz is today, which is actually a fast day in Judaism. So if I'm Jewish and I'm observing Torah, according to rabbinic Judaism, I would not be eating today, right? Because uh, how do I know? Because I looked on my Jewish calendar and it says 17th of Tammuz. That's a fast day. It's commemorating several disasters in Jewish history, including the Golden Calf incident. So it's a very sad day, it's a day of mourning. So the standard Jewish calendar, often called the Hillel calendar, that was fixed after the fall of the Second Temple is essentially a calculated calendar. What people find out when they begin following it is if they have a little pocket calendar, you know, just a normal secular calendar, they'll see in their calendar a new moon written. And then they'll look in the Jewish calendar and the new moon might be a day, two days, even three days different. And they'll think, well, it's not the new moon because your secular calendar is using astronomy. I mean, we can predict the new moons within seconds, right? And so the Jewish calendar is not always in sync with the actual new moon. So there's a difference between an observed calendar, you know, where you really look and say, oh, there's the new moon. This must be the first day of the month. And a printed calendar 
that all Jews worldwide generally would follow, you see. And basically the shortcut is just to have, buy one, to have one. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what he's talking about is this calendar. Okay, this is the Hebrew calendar. And what happens in the Hebrew calendar is like we've said, you know, if you go to the first month, first day of the month, like for Savan here, which was May 21st, this is where they would say the dark moon is, right? <clears throat> From the 20th into the 21st. Maybe it was, you know, if we went and looked at it, I haven't looked at it, maybe it was actually here. Or <clears throat> maybe it was actually here where the dark moon was. Okay, so it's always very close. Sometimes it's bang on and sometimes it's really close, but it generally is in the range of it. So if you want it to be more accurate, you can go and look up and just do a Google search and find out exactly when the new moon will be, all right? <clears throat> Excuse me, and that's easy to do. But the Jews worldwide, because they have this calendar now, they'll just stick to this calendar. So that's essentially what he's talking about. It's not a big deal, <coughs> excuse me, in that sense, because it's close, but it's still off either right on or it might be off a day on either side, okay? That's essentially what he's talking about there in that portion. Let's go to the next portion. If I'm looking back, particularly in the 20th or 19th century, and I like to know when something happened, because it, it's like a, a record of, you know, what day was, uh, say, the Sixth He's Day War, what, where was it in the Jewish calendar, or that sort of thing. So forget all that. That was the introduction. <laughs> in other words, that's to clear the deck so we can talk about what was going on in the first century. Nobody had this printed calendar, and nobody was doing these calculations. Instead, there were two competing calendars. One is a solar calendar, and one is a solar lunar, sort of. All right. So now he's going back to what it was just pre first, uh, pre like first century BC and first century AD, <coughs> to which we know is the scenes and, and a lot of that stuff, right? And there were two competing calendars there was solar and there was solar lunar, kind of. So listen to what he goes on to describe. Let's start with the solar. In Genesis 1 14, we read that the sun and the moon rule the skies and they are for signs, seasons, days, and years. So here's the idea that by, by using the sun and the moon, that would be solar, lunar, you're able to determine signs, whatever that means. Seasons is actually the word moadim, which is also a word used for the festivals or literally it's to appoint or meet. So you might think of it as divine appointments. You're supposed to meet God on a certain day, right? So there would be, it says in Leviticus, on the 15th day of the first month, you shall have a solemn assembly and you eat no unleavened bread and it's a Sabbath to the Lord. Well, that could be any day of the week, right? Because it's the day of a month, right? And so if you're following those Torah teachings, you would need to know when that is. And it would be an appointment, you might say, a meeting that you would have with your fellow believers as well as God. Now here's the problem. It's just an astronomical problem that I think you're all aware of. <laughs> there are 365.242199 days in a solar year. That is the time it takes the Earth uh, to go around the sun, right? So we, that we come back again. We roughly have adjusted that with our Julio-Gregorian calendar, with our leap years and so forth, that it works out pretty well. So if my birthday is March 2nd, uh, unless it's a leap year, when it would be 24 hours off, I can say, you know, I was born so many years ago today, and roughly I'm in the same spot around the sun within 24 hours, depending on the leap year. We humans like... <coughs> okay. So again, if you just stick solar, so he's beginning to talk about solar, and if you just stick to solar, things seem to be so much easier. Okay. So we're going to go a little bit further. Now, the lunar month is 29.530587. So if you do 12 new moons, 12 lunar months, you're only going to get about 354 days. You see that? Leaving 11 days short for the solar year. So this is the problem. So what are you going to do? If you're, the Mus if you're with the Muslims, you ignore it. But what will happen then if every year, your year, which is, 12, is uh, 354 days, is uh, that long and the solar year is 365, your months, your seasons are going to move around. Passover needs to be in the spring, don't you think? I mean, it's the festival of spring. You'll end up keeping Passover in the dead of winter one year. 
It'll move 11 days every year. Have you ever noticed Ramadan? You think Ramadan, I think it's in the seventh month, isn't it, on the Muslim calendar? But it, it moves 11 days a year. So over the years, you kind of forget and you go, oh, the Muslims are keeping Ramadan. It's January. And then later, Muslims are keeping Ramadan. It's the middle of the summer. It's really hot because they're not doing anything to keep the 12 lunar months in line with the solar. So, yeah, see, that's, <clears throat> and clearly, just following lunar, you can never do that with the Lord's feasts, obviously, right? Because the Lord's feasts are connected to the harvest model, right? It's, it's the harvest. <clears throat> so clearly you're not going to be doing that in the middle of winter. And that's where, of course, the, the Muslims have it all wrong by just going lunar. Okay. Do you see the problem? These things don't mesh perfectly. So if you're going to count your months by the appearance of the moon and then wait 29 days, uh, you're not going to come out with the solar year. So there has to be some way of putting together the solar and the lunar. Any questions on that? Because this gets kind of technical. I want to be sure you follow me. Okay, what the rabbinic calendar does, this one that I told you to forget for a minute, now you've got to go back to it just for a minute. So now he's going to go back to the Hebrew calendar, <clears throat> all right? And he's going to briefly touch on things that we know and things that we've broken down in the past. So he just shows that, you know, if, if you just stick with the lunar, uh, the lunar, you're going to be totally out of whack like the Muslims are. Now he's going back. He's going to go to solar, but he's going to go back to the Hebrew calendar and explain what they do using a loony solar. All right. So they got the solar lunar one. And this is why he's saying kind of. And you're going to understand why here in a minute. We've talked on these things, but listen why. Is it calculates in a 19 year period has 12 common years with 12 moons, but seven leap years have 13 months. So you'll have 13 month years. We don't have to do that in our calendar because we have 30 and 31 days plus leap year that's worked it all. Yeah, see, so what he's saying is in the Gregorian calendar, we don't have to worry about that because in the Gregorian calendar, <clears throat> what they've done is they've just stuck to solar. You see, so it just went solar, whereas the Hebrew calendar has has to do something to be able to make up those 11 or 11 and quarter days every year. Remember, we talked about this late last year. We've got some great videos on it on showing how many days a year the moon goes off before they adjust it every second to third year, right? They do it seven, seven years. They do it nine, out of 19 years. They do it seven times where they have to add a 13th month, right? So when we've talked on this in the past, what ends up happening is the reason why they wait two to three years, say at three years is because 11 and a quarter days would be like 34 and change days after three years. So then they add the 13th month and everything goes back in line, you see? <clears throat> or kind of, because now they're over, right? If it's 34 days, well, now they're over by about four days. So you say, well, now they're, they're, they're off by 11 and a quarter, they're off by 21 or by 23 after two, after two years. You see, so really then the whole thing seems to be out of whack and it's out of control the whole way. And then bang, they go and they bring it back into relative order, only being off generally by a day or three or four days on either side. OK, we've done videos on this and this is it's, it's one of the reasons why <clears throat> when we went to the Book of Jubilees. And let's go 10 days. You guys remember this, right? That in the book of Jubilees, it says, and there will be those who will make observations of the moon for this one. The moon corrupts its stated times and comes out early each year by 10 days. OK, this was something we've shared on. The moon comes out too early by 10 days. This is the reason why we're saying that if this isn't the escape time in here, if this isn't the seventh Sabbath then this is that'll make up those difference of 10 days remember to the lord god this is the beginning of the year to the lord god this is the end of 70 this is the beginning so even though yes it is month one in nissan to the lord god this is the beginning so what would you have well if it's off by 10 days the 25th of savan would actually be the 15th okay and if this is the truly the 15th and then you go to seven to the eight days later there you are the 21st to the 22nd, okay, which would be the equivalent 
of what we were saying the 22nd to the 3rd of Sivan would be, would then be these guys over here. <clears throat> All right? That 10-day difference in both cases. This is why this difference from here, everything that the 15th of Sivan is, is everything that the 25th of Sivan is. If the moon has to be adjusted for by 10 days. That's it. Everything still would equal everything that we talk about right here. And it would equal then, the only thing that would get added to the eighth day here is it would now line up with what we read from Psalms 18. If Psalms 18 represents the seven to the eighth day of them being there and then the Lord coming and setting them in a large place, when we go to Psalms 19, it talked about the Lord coming out of his chamber as a strong man ready to run a race, and it was related to the circuit of the sun. Well, this is June 21st the 22nd. This is what I was telling you guys about in recent videos and in the live show. This is the only year for several years back that I looked and for at least 10 years forward where the 4th of June is the 15th of Sivan, so that the 14th of June in a 10-day difference would be the 14th of June and the 25th of Sivan. Why does that matter? Because it would have to be the 25th if it's 10 days off from the 15th. It could only be the 25th, meaning that the 7 to the 8 days later has to be connected to the circuit of the sun. There's no other year in like at least five years going back and 10 years going forward that I've looked at where the 15th of Savan is June 4th, which 10 days later would equal the, 20, uh, the 14th of June and the 25th of Savan, so that the seven to the eighth day later is the circuit of the sun as uh, Psalms 19 says. So this only happens this year. So as much as it sounds like, oh no, then does it mean we have to wait to this? No, I don't think so. Because what I'm about to show you is that this date right here, all three of them are in line. You'll see what I mean when I say all three, okay? So this is what he's talking about in relation to this. The Hebrew calendar generally has to make this, adju this adjustment because it's off, uh, uh, off every 11 days because it's doing a lunar it's doing a solar kind of lunar but it can never keep up properly to the lunar so it's always out of whack and, and a little bit twisted and and adjustments have to be made like the 13th month all out to 365 and then we make up the quarter day right every four years so we but if you're gonna so see yeah in our gregorian it's much simpler because what does the gregorian calendar do it ignores the moon. It ignores the moon and it just goes off the solar. And then we make a little quarter, right? It's a quarter day missing every year. So every four years we have, we have, a, we have a, a, a leap day, right? In the leap year. You're gonna have the same length of month. Uh, you're, you're gonna have to add seven times in 19 years a second month. So what are you gonna add? Basically you go to the 12th month and just say, okay, should be 12 and then one again, right? You say, no, not one, it's 13. What it does, it, it sort of shakes the system back. But see, it's all, if you look at the years, it's doing it in the third, sixth, eighth, 11th, 14th, 17th, and 19th year. So you're off for a couple years, but not that much. You say 11 days, then another 11 days, and then the third time, oh, let's catch up so you can pull it all back again. So it'll roughly work out that you're keeping Passover around the spring because you'll catch up every three years. Sounds kind of cumbersome, doesn't it? But it does work. You see? <clears throat> this is exactly what we were just talking about and what we've been sharing about for the last year or so. That's exactly what happens. You, you, you're off 11 days. You're off 22 to 23 days. And, you know, well, that's why they would observe Passover anywhere between sometime in March into April. <clears throat> it's not at a, at a set time. It's not at a set harvest time, right? So it's, it's always in the range and within the area. And that's what he's talking about. So how would these people know when it is unless they were living in the land? In our modern days, there'd be no way to do it unless they had this calendar, right? So that's what they've done. But you could see how it's a little bit twisted and not falling in order because of its movement 
So obviously, if you moved it all and it's relatively in line and you go one year later and you don't add anything, well, then you should be off by about 11 days. You see? How are you going to be observing Passover at Passover if it's actually 11 days? Yet at the same time, if we go to the sun, moon, and stars, we could see it's in Pisces. So in that sense, following, because the moon and the, the cycle of the moon, that's what they've adjusted to, right? So they've been able to follow it with this adjustment by, by keeping the sun in the constellation when the moon gets to it for the new moon, okay? But it always falls a little bit, and there's an adjustment, and then bang, everything goes back in order. That's what he's talking about. But how would everybody in know? In a certain way. I mean, have you ever noticed? Why does uh, Passover, you say, is it in March or April? See, see what's happening? It depends on whether that extra month has been added, because one of the greatest controversies in the early Nazarene movement, or in the Catholic Church, really, was whether to set Easter by the Jewish uh, observance of Passover. And all the Eastern churches were doing that. And they were keeping Easter as the Sunday after the Jewish Passover. And at that time, the Jewish Passover was being done by uh, observation. So you would have to watch Jews. Now you're a Gentile Christian, but you've got to ask the Jews. See? <clears throat> so now what is he beginning to talk about? He's beginning to talk about a group who they were saying, okay, now they're setting everything to Easter, the Sunday after, and that's the way they're going to do it. But we know there's another group that said, no, we're not going to listen to this, right? We're going to stick by what we learned and what we know. And that, of course, those are the 14thers and through Polycarp and so forth. Well, there was another group in connected with this as well. When's Passover? Because I want to know when to keep Easter. <laughs> and so you're going to the rabbis. The church fathers did not like this in the West. So several of the popes, or let's call them bishops of Rome, there are two waves of controversy in the second century. It, it, all, it just really split the group because there were those who traced themselves back to the Apostle John and to Polycarp and Papias who said, we're not going to change. We're going to do it the way we always did it. It goes back to the Lord that he ate the Last Supper on the night before Passover. And so we're going to eat the memory of the Last Supper and then keep Sunday Easter that week of Passover. And in the West... You see? <laughs> but he mixes it up there. And then we're going to keep the Sunday of... Uh, of of Easter. No, 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 that's not what he said. That's not what that's not what the 14thers said, right? Remember what it was with the 14ers. The 14thers refused to follow what the church said about Easter. They weren't going to stick with Easter being the following Sunday. They were going to hold it on the feast day on which it's supposed to be held, which is the 14th day of Nisan. And they established it when the barley was found ripe after the new moon of Nisan 1. So you see, you can still say, see, near the, the, the Jewish lunar month. So what happened is the, um, uh, 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 the 14thers would say, we learned from, through Polycarp, who learned from the Apostle John. And we are to do this when the Abid barley is ready at the time, usually at around the time frame of the Hebrew calendar, the Jewish calendar at Nisan 1. So if at the time of Nisan 1, the barley was Abib and they knew it was going to be ready, then they knew 14 days later at the 14th of Nisan, that was true Passover and they were going to observe it regardless of what the church was changing and doing and saying, okay, well, we know this is when the Passover is, but we're going to observe it on the Sunday, regardless. And these guys, the 14thers, you see, they were doing it because of the 14 days of the 14th day of the first month. And here we are, 14ers in the end of days, and we're doing it because of the revelation of the 14 years. You see the connection? And what were they? Well, they were the early church, right? They were what? Polycarp, who was the one who learned from John the Apostle, was the Bishop of Smyrna. Smyrna, ring a bell. You see, <clears throat> remember this from the Creator's Calendar guy? Man, remember, it's not full moon, new moon. That's what this guy believes. It is not true, okay? But what does he talk about? 
the early Christians were not called Christians. He said the true early Christians were the quadradecimen. They were the 14er. He calls them 14ers. They were 14thers. And what was it from? True 14th of Abib. What was it at Abib that they were following? Listen to this. Deuteronomy 16. Observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God in the month of Abib. Okay? Abib was the ripening of the barley. Okay? That's how they knew it. And at the new moon of it, they would go and see if it was ripe and they knew that the season and time was ready to harvest. Okay? So you're going to see now, what does that have to do with the Jewish calendar this year? What does that have to do and how can we know it from the 14thers back then to account for it this year? And what does it have to do with the Essenes? So right now, he's still finishing this portion about connecting it to more so showing that clearly just lunar you can't do, as the Muslims have done. And then the loony solar, or the solar with loony kind of mix, it, it throws things off, but it will be in sync sometimes. And then if you go just solar, everything seems to be very smooth. It really does. And you're going to see this conversation, except there's a problem with it. And we're going to share that to you. They excommunicated all the churches of Asia Minor because they wouldn't change. And they wanted to tie it to the vernal equinox and forget the okay. Jews. And so then what did they want to do? They said, no, we're tying it to the vernal equinox. Okay. <clears throat> we're going to tie it to the equinox. Wait until you see how this connects. They say, no. So what happened? The Essenes and all those guys in that group, they said, forget it. You guys do that. We're going to do this. They end up following through through um, the Essenes, right? Through the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's what you see some of in uh, the Book of Jubilees, but it's not, a, it's not much clarity. There's more in it in other Essenes writings. And you find out that they connect it by sticking only to solar. And it seems to make sense, right? <clears throat> because let's not forget with Enoch, Enoch was what? 365 years that are a type of days. And you're going to see that what the Essenes did is the Essenes did it through 364, right? They kept 30, 30, 30, 31, 30, 30, 30, 31, 30, 30, 30, 30 31, right? And then that equaled 364. And then they had one dead day, which was probably connected to the, uh, to the equinox. But there was no accounting of a quarter day. Well, funny enough, neither was Enoch. It was 365, right? But there must have been something that accounted or adjusted for it. So you're going to see why this is important that this year, <clears throat> that at the equinox, this is what the solar only Essenes were doing. And you're going to see why the importance of it this year to the connection to the Jewish calendar that has Nissan 1 right here from the 22nd into the 23rd. This only happens this year. Passover. So sometimes it'll be close, other times it won't be close, has no association whatsoever. <clears throat> so uh, it's floating. And eventually the great church accepted that, except for small dissident groups that said, no, we're still gonna follow um, Passover. But see, <laughs> you see, we, we would be those classified in the in the small dissident group <laughs> let's keep going you're gonna have to figure out some way to make it work because it's 11 days off now we come to the essenes the so-called jubilees calendar it's a solar calendar all of a sudden you ignore the moons moons don't matter because the actual word for moon right here or month month comes from moon is just the word uh kodesh or kadosh rather it just means new. And so their understanding was, if you say this month, this is Exodus 12, will be for you the first of the news of the year, not news like good news, but of the new things, uh, of the turning of the year, then you, you could make an argument that it doesn't have to do with the moon. It doesn't say this moon, right? Yareach, it says this new, meaning new 30-day period. That's how they understand it. A month is 30 days. So this new, meaning this new 30-day period will be here, and then another 30 and another 30. Okay, <clears throat> so right off the bat, this 
this is the Essenes, right? That Jubilees Essenes. This right off the bat seems to have an issue, doesn't it? Right off the bat, it has an issue because they're going solar only. And this is what we were sharing, <clears throat> that when we go into Leviticus 23 and you go to the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets tells you what it is, okay? At the seventh month, the first day of the month at the new moon. The new moon is the, repil the repairing of the moon. You're going to sound the trumpet. Well, when is it? It's at the new moon. So the moon clearly has to be involved with establishing your months. So you see how there's a problem here, right? <clears throat> In fact, when we go to Genesis 1.14, remember I told you earlier to remember this? That the fourth day was when the sun, moon, and stars, right, were created. It was the fourth day. You're going to want to remember that still. Well, what happened? Right? It says in verse 14, it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years, and let them be in the firmament of heaven, uh, sorry, of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also and set them in the firmament, okay? So <clears throat> you have the sun, moon, and stars, which are there to establish the days, the years, the seasons, and so forth. So you can't just disregard the moon as the Essenes did, and they did it because this trying to account for, <clears throat> for the 11 days and change, it could never happen without having to have a struggle with trying to bring the moon back in line like the Hebrew calendar did. So listen to what theirs sounds like. It sounds terrific. It sounds like it works really well, except there's still the issue of the moon that can't be denied, okay? <clears throat> oh, you'll understand why this all connects and why it makes sense. So now he's going to go on and show what their calendar looks like, and you could always zoom into it, all right, and have a better look. But Wednesday, Thursday. So they had the first day of the week on a Wednesday. So when you establish the calendar the way these guys did by going only solar <clears throat> and starting based on the equinox being the last day of the year, the spring equinox, that means you'll find out that the day after the equinox is when they started the year. No, nope, that's not why it works. Only on the Wednesday after the spring equinox did they start. So let's go back to this calendar in 2012. So this is 2012, and let's just see what it says, okay? So in 2012, you had the spring equinox, okay? It was on a Tuesday. And you would say, see? So if the spring equinox is on a Tuesday, the following Wednesday to them would be the beginning of the year. But look at where it was for the Hebrew calendar. It was off. You see, in virtually every year, in all of them, like I said, from 2015 to 2037, they're all, and I just didn't bother looking further, they're all different. Every single one of them, except the closeness in 2023. But you see the difference here? <clears throat> well, in some years, let me just, let me give you another example. Let's go to 2018. If we go to 2018, and we go to the equinox, okay? The equinox is on a Wednesday. So if it falls on a, on a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, whatever, the first day of the year is the following Wednesday. So if the equinox follows, falls here or here or here or here or here or here, the first day of the year is the following Wednesday from the equinox. So that's why if it falls on a Tuesday, then the Wednesday that follows, which is the next day, is the first day of the year for them, okay? So that's how they did it. That's what's going on with their calendar because the creation of the sun, moon, and stars was on day four. So they make Wednesday, okay? The Wednesday is the fourth day of creation, you see? So by going to the fourth day of creation, making Wednesday the first day of the year, it made everything straightforward to them. And it always kept everything in sync. So what they knew then is that everybody's birthday, everybody's observation, everybody's times, all, all the festivals and everything would always be at the same time. Sounds familiar, right? 
it's very similar to the Gregorian calendar, except it starts connected to the, to the equinox. Whereas the Gregorian calendar, you see what happened? The Gregorian calendar was in the spring, but now it's in January. Why? Because they've moved it two months because from the creation, it's moved by two months. So they moved it forward. Whereas in the creation, it was in Taurus. See, and now Taurus is Savan. And on the Hebrew calendar, you go Taurus, then you have Aries and Pisces. So where is it now? It's in Pisces. But the Gregorians went forward from spring. You see, and they brought it two months forward. And that's what messed it up and brought it into January in the middle of winter. They're, they're on the wrong side bringing it forward. But these guys kept it at the equinox. And by keeping it at the equinox and going to the Wednesday after, everything would always generally, you know, everything would be at the same time every year. Everything would be in sync. Like the Gregorian calendar, except the Gregorian calendar has moved it forward by two months. But essentially, if they had kept it at the, at the spring equinox time frame, then you're essentially saying the Gregorian calendar. That's why we keep what? 365 days. What did they keep? 365 days. You see? Okay, now here's where it really gets interesting. Um, the solar, we can construct it from the Dead Sea Scrolls. We almost could construct it from Jubilees, but there were a few questions, but now it's, it's, it works out pretty well. Here are your 12 months, forget the 13 months, because you're just gonna have the solar year. And I put in red the feast days. What the sectarians just loved about this is every day of the month corresponds to a day of the week forever and ever. So if you were born, let's pick a day. You were born on the second month on the sixth day. Every year, on the second day of the sixth month, you go, oh, here's Wednesday, it's my birthday again. Doesn't that feel good? I feel like the cosmos is kind of in sync, don't you? Not all this changing around, adding things. It's the same as the day I was born 50 years ago. And so you can begin to associate these days with Sabbaths. I was born on a Sabbath on this day, and my grandfather was this. You begin to feel like this, oh, God is a God of perfection. He's not going to create some crazy chaotic thing that doesn't fit, like moons don't fit solar, and you've got to add things. So this is much better, don't you think? I think we should switch to this. How about you? And how nice that Passover is always going to be Tuesday night on the first month, and I won't have to go out and look at the moon like some pagan moon watcher. I can just, I, I can count to 12, and then I can count to 12 again, and again, and again. What harmony, what peace. Hey, did you hear that? <clears throat> Check this out in 2023. Watch this. Only in 2023, here is your equinox, right? March 21st, on the Wednesday following is the beginning of their solar, right? That, that Jubilees, Essenes calendar. It, it begins this year on the Wednesday, on the 22nd of March. The Hebrew calendar begins the 22nd into the 23rd of March. Do you remember there's, there's a brother... Oh, shoot, I can't remember his channel name. He has a gray beard, glasses. He, he looks like he's a bit of a smaller guy. He has a, a cap that he wears. And I think he's from Canada, actually. I think he's just north of me in Edmonton, from what I heard from one of his videos. And <clears throat> he had mentioned a couple months ago, too, that this year was really exciting because there's an alignment this year. Because, you see, it's right in this time frame for the first time in a long time where it's connected to the start after the equinox. In 2015, the Adar starts on this side, Adar, uh, sorry, Nissan 1. And in 2037, Nissan 1 starts over here. So is it close to the Essenes in 2015 and in 2037? Yes, but it's on the wrong side because the Essenes say this is, well, of course, the spring equinox and the Wednesday that follows is the beginning of the year so they're they're still on the wrong side over here only in 2023 my brothers and sisters does the hebrew calendar and the essene jubilees calendar line up at the same time so what did they say remember because of the moon the hebrew calendar might remember we were talking about that earlier that's why i brought it up it might not be directly always in sync with the moon, 
but it's it's always close and generally lands right on it, right? But it could be a day or so off. That's what's going on here. So what happens? They would say that they know the 14th day of Nissan is always what? A Tuesday. Well, this year, you see, just because of this Nissan being here, it begins here. But to them, it begins here. What's the difference here? It was literally the difference of their counting from the moon. So really, they're actually in sync this year, and they're actually in sync this year. This is very important, because this has never happened in a long time and will not happen for decades, or at least 15 years further. At least. It will never happen again. It only happens this year. And do you know what happened this year? The 14thers, or those who were watching for a bead for the barley, at the beginning of Nissan, on Nissan 1, on March 23rd, had proclaimed that the barley was a beeb and ready? Do you see what I'm telling you here? That for the first time in a decade at least, and for the first time in at least 15 years forward, the Essene solar calendar, the Hebrew solar lunar-ish calendar, and the 14thers proclaiming Abib are all in sync this year and no other year for 25 years in an alignment of time. It never happens again. Do you realize what I'm saying? Do you realize this with the 14 years between 70 and 70? Never happens again. The alignment of their calendars, the declaration of Abib, all three of them in alignment never happens again. Do you see why this is so important and why I was so excited by it? Listen, I'm not done yet. We're almost there. God originally created this. Genesis 1, verse 14, I believe it was the fourth day, we call it Wednesday, when the sun and moon were made. So I think the year ought to start on Wednesday, because the first, in other words, we are in harmony now with the way things were uh, just a few days before Adam and Eve were made. See? So this was extremely satisfying to these people, and I don't know what they did with the leap year, but you see how in months 3, 6, 9, and 12, they're adding the 31. So that's going to catch you up to the 364. See that? And then they've got to just, uh, they had a dead day, I think, for the five, and we don't know what they did for the quarter. But uh, I put in red where, when these festivals, festivals would occur, like in the first and seventh month, you're going to have, this would be New Year's Day, Wednesday. This would be Passover. This would be the last day of unleavened bread. This would be Yom Kippur. And let's see, this would be Shavuot. So we can always figure out uh, the 50 days because it's always going to be on Sunday, the 15th of the third month. Boom. Did you hear that? So what these guys, by always having the calendar set like this, that they knew in this solar only and having established it, the Essenes Jubilee calendar had it set that on the Sunday, of the third month would be the 15th day for Shavuot. Did you hear that? The 15th day of the third month for their calendar would always be on a Sunday. Well, guess what? If this is actually in alignment, and like we said, it's, it's like a day or so, and sometimes then on months it'll be bang on, look what happens. It was in alignment with the solar Essenes calendar, it's in alignment with the Hebrew calendar, and it was a B barley, which means there they were, here they were, and the to them, the 15th day of the third month would always be on what? On a Sunday. Ta-da! The 15th day of the third month is on a Sunday because this year, the Hebrew calendar and the Essene solar only 
So solar, lunar, solar, lunar, all in alignment with the 14thers who said they would only truly begin at a beeb, and this year was a beeb. The 14thers have it for the Abib starting from true Nissan, and they followed the Abib based on the word that month one Nissan means Abib, and it's related to barley. And what did these Essenes do? The Book of Jubilee, the Essenes, it says the literal interpretation of Shabbat as the weekly Shabbat was shared by the author of the Book of Jubilees, who was motivated by the priestly sabbatical solar calendar to have festivals and Sabbaths fall on the same day of the week every year on this calendar, best known as the book of uh, best known from the book of luminaries in the book of Enoch. Listen to this. Shavuot fell on the 15th of Sivan, a Sunday. The date was reckoned 15 days from the first Sabbath after Passover, i.e. the 25th of Nisan. You see, because for them, they're they're doing it over here, right? They're, look, look at this, going from the 25th of Nisan. So what did they do? Because of how they established their days. So they would say the Sabbath, the morrow after the Sabbath. And if everything ran on their solar, then this would be the morrow after. You see? You know what's interesting? Is they didn't call this the morrow after the Sabbath. They started from the 25th. This is exactly what we've been talking about. But for us, you see, the count was either going to be from the 16th or it was going to be from the 23rd. What was the difference? The difference was it was either going to be from here and land us to the 8th of Savan or it was going to be from here that would land us to the 15th of Savan. This one was not really clear to us in scripture in relation to the story with Moses. This one is. And how do we know it? It brought us back to the story that we were talking about in Exodus. That when you get to Exodus chapter 19, it says it was the third month, same day, which is the 15th day of the third month. And from the 15th day of the third month, it then gave a 50-day count. And so the only way to get that in a proper count, you see, I am not showing this to tell you that the Essenes Jubilee count is correct. It is not correct because they're only using solar. You cannot use only solar. The scripture is clear that you must also use the moon to establish your months. But the point is, this year, it, it lands that the Sunday is the 15th of Savan, and on the lunar solar of the Hebrew calendar, Sunday is the 15th day of the third month, and doing the true count from Scripture from the 14th day of of April, which is the 23rd of Nisan, which is essentially the same thing these guys did with a different count. You see the difference of two days and why we can still end up with the same count is because they counted it as 50 days. We know it as seven Sabbaths. One, two, three, four, five, six, seventh Sabbath. Because new moon days are not counted, you see? The dark moon, it's not counted. When is it at the crescent of the moon? These are days as well. They're, they're another type of appointed days. So we know not to count it. But for them, what did they do? They just counted 50. They didn't have the proper understanding yet either of seven Sabbaths, then shall you number 50 days. When we do this count, and follow the count of what it was with Moses, they fled on the 15th, and so what happened for seven days? It's when they got to the, to the Red Sea. And then when the Red Sea happened and they crossed over, what happened? The count began of the Feast of Weeks. Why? Because this is the Passover week. This is unleavened bread. And so bang, they crossed the Red Sea. 
And when they cross the Red Sea, what do you have? Seven Sabbaths. <clears throat> That's why it was the same day of the third month from when they left, which was the 15th day. So we have better understood the count than what the Essenes have because they've only gone solar. And the Hebrew calendar we've been showing is on track and is correct using the solar lunar, which it does. And they both land on the same date, which according to the 14thers would have been in agreement for the first day because it was barley abib which then brought them to the same time right here that would have been in alignment with the solar of the essenes and would have been in alignment with the hebrew calendar only this year all three of them are in order brothers and sisters this is the only time in years that this will happen it's right here. Did you see that? It's right here. Is it because they were right? No. You need the solar. But their best way of accounting for it without throwing the year off because the moon screws everything up. It is the prettiest, the simplest, the most accurate. But it doesn't jive with the moons. And so this solar adjustment thing that happens, or this lunar adjustment that happens with the Hebrew, they're aligning it with the constellations. And when the sun is there and the moon comes in, it falls into alignment. Guys, this is the crux of it. This is the only year where this happens. In a 25-year span that I have looked at, this is the only year where this happens. Brothers and sisters, man, get excited. I, I, I'm jumping out of my skin. I was so freaking out today <laughs> doing all that part from Yanni's, from Yanni's find and, and seeing that Luke actually has the detailed story of creation built into it. What? Which is also the revelation of the end, which we have revealed is already the revelation of the end and through the discourse of the beginning and the end and the end and the beginning. And then to add this to the end of it, to find out knowing that this is the end of 70, that there's only 14 years between the two 70s, and then that only this year, the Essene group, the 14er group, the Hebrew calendar group, all of them are in alignment only this year for Sunday, the 15th of Savan on June 4th of 2023. And it's the end of the Lord God 70, which is what? The 365th day for Enoch and the Lord took him. And then what follows? The seven day wedding in heaven, brothers and sisters. Hold on tight. I am excited like crazy, but I will tell you this, I still keep a little grain of salt because this is also the only year that 10 days later will give us the seven day wedding followed by the return of the Lord on the eighth day when we account for that difference of the moon. But like I said, that's the only grain of salt I'm holding because every other piece of salt is going or every other piece of revelation is going to right here because i showed you from that girl's video connected to the 16th and my two videos were the 22nd and 23rd of savan the lord's time of his return after seven days to the eighth day and the video was of the mark of the beast when the Lord comes to reveal at the 40 days the understanding of the mark of the beast. <laughs> it's been a crazy day of just pondering and, and, and scriptures flying in from everywhere and piecing it all together. And then to put this all together from, the, from that video that all of them are in harmony this year. Oh my goodness. Brothers and sisters, I pray you're ready. 
This video should be able to help take you through, hold you tight, strengthen you, and keep you diligently seeking. God bless you all. Thank you for all your prayers, for all your support. Thank you for having the eyes and the ears and your open and your heart circumcised, allowing the spirit to come in and to strengthen you and to reveal to you and diligently deal, digging in for yourselves to see that these things are true and understanding them for yourselves and finding more. You know the Lord is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And brothers and sisters, this is a group of Enoch's. This is a group of those prepared for the Johns and the Elijahs. There are a mix of this here in this group. Brothers and sisters, I look forward to meeting you. And remember, if you're taken to the third heaven, go to the lowest room and wait to see if the Lord's going to call you up. But go to the lowest room. Don't go to the highest room and be ashamed being called back down. Go to the lowest room. Brothers and sisters, we will meet you there or we will be here girded about, strengthened and ready, knowing that when the Lord returns from the wedding, we will be prepared. We will be girded and he will bring us to that open place, that large open space where he will serve us and give us his light and empower us in the revealing of the completion of the understanding. Brothers and sisters, I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you very soon. Bye for now.